Betty White. What a great way to stop pop star today to honor what would have been the Hollywood icon's 100th birthday on Monday. Her former assistant shared one of the last photos taken of Betty. Look at that picture. That's great. Before her passing in December, seen here smiling in the snapshot from December 20th and her assistant Kirsten writing in the caption, she was radiant and beautiful and happy as ever. Thanks to all of you who are doing kind things today and every day to make the world a better place. And it's true because yesterday was an impressive day for fans who set out to do good in honor of Betty's centennial birthday. Animal shelters around the country reporting an influx in donations thanks to that hashtag Betty White challenge that was circulating social media. Just one more way that Betty left such a positive impact on the world. Next up, Law & Order. This is a full circle mo moment for one young actor whose childhood dream came true by landing a gig on the most recent episode of SVU. Let's start at the beginning. Back in November, 13 Reasons Why star Christian Navarro shared on Instagram that when he was just nine years old, he got a chance to meet the cast of one of his favorite shows. They were shooting an episode in his hometown of Hunts Point, New York. So now 15 years later, He's made it into season 23 of the hit NBC series, and he was guest starring in Thursday's episode. Navarro writing on Instagram, dream come true to go toe to toe with Mirshka Hargitay and Ice-T. If that's not a sign of how long this show has been on TV, I don't know what is. It will never end. All right, that's a good thing. Yeah, finally, Sports Illustrated. We've got an exclusive first look at the magazine's February issue, which previews the Beijing Winter Olympics. The upcoming edition has not one, but four special covers featuring female athletes from Team USA, including alpine skier Michaela Schifrin, of course, cross-country skier Jesse Diggins, speed skater Aaron Jackson, and ice hockey player Abby Rock. You can check out more of these amazing athletes on the Sports Illustrated website. That is issue uh, is out on Thursday and that is your pop star and here's why the show's called pop star plus even more headlines we'll start with Will Smith check out how the actor and his mom celebrated her big birthday this week Yep, that's Will and his mother, Caroline Bright, and check out those moves. Not Will's, mom's, those are great. And happy birthday, not bad, for 85 years young. Good stuff. Coming up next, we've got Serena Williams, the tennis superstar known for twinning with her four-year-old daughter, might actually have a mini-me in the making. Check out this video of little Olympia working on her backhand. Look at that stroke. I mean, that's flawless, that's impressive. Then you got Aunt Venus jumping in on the comments section. She writes, it's Aura Scene all over again. Of course, referencing the famous tennis sister's mother and coach, Orsine Price. Who knows, maybe Serena might be serving up the next great tennis star. And for those of you who are looking for more pop start headlines, we've got a lot more coming up today. We're gonna chat with our good buddy, Valerie Bertinelli. Stay tuned for that. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it what's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the way, I'm in the Richards. All right, it just did too. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. And welcome back. Thanks for checking out Popstar Plus. We appreciate it. Valerie Bertinelli is getting very real in her new memoir, Enough Already, Learning to Love the Way I Am Today. And she joined us to tell us all about it. 
Valerie Bertinelli is beloved by so many. She's loved because of her recipes. She's loved because she's so open and honest about the successes and the struggles in her life. And you can find both of them in her new book. It's a beautiful title. It's called Enough Already, Learning to Love the Way I Am Today. We're going to talk with Valerie in just a second. But first, a look at why we love her so much. So in a caprese salad, is fresh vine ripe tomatoes. She is as comfortable teaching us how to cook with her approachable recipes as she is starring in sitcoms that first put her in the limelight. Get in there, you. Audiences fell in love with Valerie Bertinelli when she was just 15 years old, playing Barbara Cooper on One Day at a Time. I'm the only kid I know who goes to confession and has to make up sins. <laughs> her life has been in the public eye ever since. From her years married to rock star Eddie Van Halen and the birth of their son Wolfie to co-starring with the late Betty White on the hit show Hot in Cleveland. Her battle with weight became part of her journey, dating back to her days as the face of Jenny Craig. But it is the inner struggles about the pressures of weight and self-image that Valerie has found comfort in sharing, opening up with us here on Today. I have to learn how to love myself today as is. That emotional roller coaster has been part of her road to healing. I'm standing out in the rain. Because mm. I'm doing my best to distract my mind from spiraling to a place of self-loathing because I saw a picture of myself today that made me want to do that. Now, in her new memoir, Enough Already, Learning to Love the Way I Am Today, the 61-year-old gives an honest and raw account of her path to acceptance and openness. Valerie's truth includes openness about the recent separation from her second husband. And for the first time, she shares the deeply personal final moments with Eddie Van Halen, who remained a central part of her life until his death in 2020. I knew the man for 40 years. I was 20 when I met him. I still loved him. Uh, we spent a lot of time together. He, he's the father of my son. He's the father of the greatest gift in my life. And I miss him, I, and I'm allowed to miss him. As she continues to work on her own mental and physical well-being, Valerie feels blessed, trying not to dwell on the negative while giving herself permission to feel joy. Remember to be grateful, and I am grateful, even through all the mess, because there's still good in all the mess. Oh, there is good in all the mess. We're so delighted to have Valerie with us. Hi, Valerie. How are you? Hi, Hoda. Well, I wasn't planning on crying this morning. <laughs> I know. You know what? I wasn't planning on starting with this part of the book, but I was watching you watch it, and so I feel like I have to. Um, <laughs> you found your soulmate in Eddie Van Halen, Ed, and saying goodbye to a soulmate has to be among the most wrenching things in the world to do. And then mm -hmm. you put it right there on the pages, not just your loss, but your son's. Tell me about that. I, I, when, I, when I wrote it and when I did it, it was very cathartic to go through it. I didn't intend to write a book um, that had a lot of grief in it. Um, it was about joy. And um, if I left that part out, it wouldn't, it wouldn't show you the path to joy and, and how to find that even through the depths of um, the biggest grief you can feel. And I know a lot of people have been feeling that across the country and across around the world. You know, we've all dealt with a lot of grief in the last couple of years. So um, at first it was very, um, it felt very raw and um, vulnerable to write about it, but I thought it was true, it was real. And it was something that I wanted to express about love and how love is just so important to remember even when you're going through all of the pain. And to have found a soulmate. People go their whole lives, Valerie, and don't find that. They go to their grave and they don't find it. You had it. I know, but you know what? I don't think, um, I think soulmates, I think we have more than just one. I think mm -hmm. that, um, I feel like partly Wolfie is, is a soulmate of mine. Mm -hmm. I think when I think of soulmate, I think of souls that come here to experience this life on earth together again and to get through and get to a higher place. Mm -hmm. So um, I definitely, definitely know that was part of Ed. I loved his soul deeply. Hmm. And um, we went through a lot of hell as well. I mean, we weren't really good to each other at a lot of a lot of points in our lives because we met so young and, and we were very immature. But I'm, I'm so happy that we were able to come to a beautiful place by the mm -hmm. end of his life. And um, 
I just, I wish he was still here. <laughs> oh, Valerie, this is a big book. It's about so many mm -hmm. things. It's about, we, get, we got to watch you evolve. We got to watch you. I got to watch you. I feel like firsthand. It and, started with you. <laughs> uh, I'm so touched. But I have to say, I feel like we have a lot in common because we both come from pleasing. How can I make you feel mm -hmm. better? I'll twist myself into a pretzel so you'll feel better. I want to make sure mm -hmm. I'll put a circle in a square so you'll feel better. But you were managing to crack that nut, and that's not an easy one to crack. How did you? Uh, because you can't make another person feel better if you're coming from a broken place. I mean, we all come from broken places. Life is not easy. And um, I think that when you can still step through that and, and look at the gratitude that, it, mm -hmm. that you can see in your life, there is so much to be grateful for, even in the depths of the mess <laughs> because it can be messy um it's just about switching your mind to focus on the positive and uh -huh. focus on the gifts that you have in your life and we all have them and it's about telling the truth like speaking it out loud and i didn't know when i was interviewing you back then that you were going through what would be what would later or be, prove to be the end of your your current marriage mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. to say it out loud it kind of pushes you into a place because uh, I'm a big old procrastinator. I like to put things off until the last minute. So I think and I also want to be um, gentle and caring and not just rip off a Band-Aid. I like to pull mm -hmm. it off gently. But I think there is definitely um, power mm -hmm. and, and peace in changing your narrative and changing the way that you can look at your life. I know it is for me when I change the way I looked at my life and stop beating myself up most of the time <laughs> it still it reaches in there but uh, um there is power in that and peace this book by the way and i'm holding it in my hand because i love it so much it's full of life lessons they pop out on every single page anyone who's going through a difficult time if you pick this book up i know that you'll feel like a warm hand on your heart and before i say goodbye to you valerie and well of course i'll visit with you again later on the 10 um you had a chance to work with betty white most people mm. knew her but never felt her the way you did just a couple of words about betty before we say goodbye I, she was magical that's i mean there's no other way to explain that that lovely woman and she is the one that taught me so much about gratitude mm. betty walked in gratitude mm. and and she was grateful for every moment of her life for every thing that happened to her and she was just i can't i say this all the time because it's so true and anybody that knew her knew this she glowed she was otherworldly she she was an angel here on earth for wow. sure and i'm actually as sad as i am that we don't get to be with her any longer i am so happy she's with alan right now mm. Oh, what a beautiful sentiment. Valerie, we're going to talk more in our fourth hour, but this book, Enough Already, is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful read. Thank you so much, and thanks for Thank being you, open. Uh, and it's out today, so please pick it up. Love Valerie. She's family around here. We've got more Val coming up in just a minute. Her quoted by Conversation with Hoda. We'll have it next on Popstar Plus. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? We began our across America journey tonight, St. Louis, Austin. Here in Nashville. From Washington, D.C., the side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore.
What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. And we're back on Popstar Plus with more from Chef, TV host, and our good friend Valerie Bertinelli. Now, in this episode of Quoted By, she talks with Hoda about finding joy within herself. One of America's favorite people, and right mostly here. one of mine, <laughs> Valerie Bertinelli is here. And I always feel like you live your life with a good kind of inner compass. When we brought this up, when we, I wondered, I said to myself, like, what quote is Valerie going to choose? It was hard. Yeah. It was really uh -huh. hard because there's so many amazing quotes out there mm -hmm. that are inspirational. But I always go back to Dr. Seuss. Oh, I like that. And I absolutely love, mm -hmm. I mean, he's been inspiring me since I was a very young girl. It was the very first book that my father would read to me, mm. uh, all of the Dr. Seuss books. And one quote always, always stood out of his mm -hmm. because it was my father who was always telling me, you have to make sure everybody likes you. You mm -hmm. have to, you know. And as you get older, you realize that's scientifically impossible mm -hmm. to have everybody like you. So be who you are mm -hmm. and say how you feel mm -hmm. because those who mind don't matter mm -hmm. and those who matter don't, don't mind. mind. <laughs> That's good. So as long as I start to really con continue to remember that all the people that love me for who I am, mm -hmm. I don't have to be pretend to be anybody because I can't make somebody like me no matter how, how hard I pretend to be something that I think they may like. Mm -hmm. So isn't it just easier just to be myself be and those who love me will love me for who I am. Now how long, because that's a lesson, like you said, you were told that by your parents. I think a lot of us were. Be mm -hmm. nice. Everyone's mm -hmm. going to like you. You mm -hmm. want to be popular. Be nice. Mm -hmm. At what stage did you actually learn this lesson? What time is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a gradual kind of process, and it's something that doesn't come easily mm -hmm. when it's been ingrained in my brain yes. to make sure that you treat. And I still believe in treating everybody with kindness, no matter how they feel about me. I'll still right. treat them with kindness. Right. But um, it's really starting to resonate more as I'm going on this journey of 2020 of finding myself and finding my mm -hmm. joy that the, the right people... And I have so many beautiful people around me that already love me for who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, the crazy Valerie, the loud Valerie, you know, the, uh, the, the anything Valerie. Because they also see my heart and see my intentions. And I think um, those are the people I want to keep around me the most. I think by you doing this and even talking about this particular quote, because um, this one this one resonates with, with me too. And I was trying to figure out, like, how do I stop caring if someone doesn't like me? Have you figured that out or does it still deep down inside you give you an ouch? I care less. Yeah. Um, because when I, when I, and it, it's a really good practice seeing what trolls will say about you huh. online. Um, yeah. Just recently someone was, you know, calling me chubby online. Yeah. And um, that could sting, but I think it has more to do with someone wanting to be seen, be heard. Yeah. And if they do that, if they say this about me, then someone will notice them. So yeah. it made me feel compassion for that person. Wow. And I can bless them and go, yeah, I'm chubby, but it's not a bad thing. It's not wow. a bad thing. And I'm, I'm sorry that you're feeling so much pain. So God bless you. Oh, it's always great to hear from Valerie. We love her. Again, check out her book. It's out. It's called Enough Already. And it is fantastic. Now we have a bonus quoted by because Hoda also sat down with R&B legend, Miss Mary J. Blige. All right. This is one of my favorite segments. It's called Quoted By. And I'm with one of my favorite people who I find incredibly inspiring. If you know anything about Mary J. Blige's life, you know about overcoming, you know about persevering, and you also know about just finding out who you are. So I am so happy to be sitting here with you because I just am. And I just wondered, do you have like a guiding light, Mary J., a quote that speaks to you? Yes, um, it's a quote that was given to me by one of my favorite artists when I first met her the Shaka Khan, and she told me that I needed to get out of my own way. And I, and I think she was speaking vocally as well. She said, once you learn how to do that, you're going to be able to do anything. And later on in life, it didn't really click what she was saying until I started seeing how I was doubting myself in everything and second guessing myself in everything. And that's me jumping in my own way instead of trusting everything that I am. Oh, that was, whew, gave myself the chills. <laughs> Trust in everything that I am because everything I am is what I am. And I can only give you me. 
So if I got to stop doubting me, I can only give you the greatness of me. Do you ever think like one thing I think people struggle with too is I, I read a quote, I mean a quote, I loved it. It says you're the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. So choose wisely. Yes. Did you have to kind of unload or say goodbye to people in your life to kind of clear your path? And how hard was that? Listen, environment is everything. So in order to grow, you have to change your environment. If you, in order to get something new, you have to see something new. Mm. If my environment didn't change when I was living in Yonkers in the projects, if I didn't see something else, I had girlfriends that took me out of the projects and I experienced Benzes and, and jewelry and, and furs and condos and houses. And I saw something else. So that made me want something else. So the environment is extremely important and, and you're gonna shed people, shed people. And it's gonna be a little sad, but they have to go. When things start to stall, Someone has to get off the boat or get off the bus. Everyone's not going. It's too heavy. You know, when the bus stops, somebody has to get off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. So, yes. In, in, <laughs> yes, because you can only carry so many people. You're right. You're absolutely right. And do you, uh, lastly, Mary G, have any advice for people who are, some people are feeling um, either alone or their problems are getting magnified just because of the current environment that we're living in. What advice would you have for them? First of all, loneliness is hard. If you're by yourself at this moment, take this time to get to know you. Take this time to absorb you, to embrace you, to talk to you. You know, people say you're crazy when they say talk to you, you know, talk to yourself, but talk to yourself, love yourself, greet yourself in the morning, take a bath, you know, do something, give yourself a natural oatmeal facial, whatever you do, but use the time instead of having a woe is me moment and lift yourself up mm. and be patient in the moment you know because i think sometimes we end up by ourselves because things have to be fixed in order for people to come the right mm. people to come around you, you understand i think i heard about 10 quotes in there that i want to steal and take as if they were my own okay <laughs> mary J. You are so full of inspiration. Thank you for doing our Quote Advice series. Good luck with Thank all you. with your new music. Uh, you're gonna come back to see us hopefully in Studio 1A soon, as soon as the lights turn back on. Um, and we miss you. Oh, love Mary J. She's the best. Wise words from a true music icon. Coming up, we're heading into the Today Show vault to celebrate Kevin Costner's birthday. Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the man with the Richard. All right, it just made it too. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. And we're back on Popstar Plus. You know, for more than three decades, Kevin Costner has been one of the biggest names in Hollywood. And to mark the star's 67th birthday today, we've got a clip from the vault when he stopped by to talk about a oh, classic movie, The Untouchables. This is back in 1987. Kevin Costner was the loony Jake in Silverado. He was dead in the big chill before the movie even began. He is one of the few new stars Hollywood is counting on with very high hopes. And now he is ready with the lavish new gangster movie, The Untouchables, in which he is the famous treasury agent who went after Al Capone, Elliot Ness. 
Good morning, Elliot. Good morning, Kevin. One and the same in this movie, which I mean as a compliment. This Elliot Ness is different from the perception of him I had before I saw the movie. He's sort of innocent. He's sort of uh, dopey almost at the beginning, yeah. like he's in over his head. Uh, yeah, I think that's what David uh, Mamet, who wrote the script, had in mind. I think one thing uh, that he did was he chose to ignore the expectations people have of Elliot Ness. That was a tough one to swallow for me because I was very fond of this series, but I think in doing so, he created an original movie. The truth of the case is that the man Capone is a killer and he will go free. There is only one way to deal with such men and that is hunt them down. I have. I have forsworn myself. I have broken every law I swore to defend. I have become what I beheld and I am content that I have done right. Now that man must be stopped and you must- I'll be the judge of what I must do, Mr. Ness. It's an untraditional movie in a sense that uh, I think Elliot's probably the hardest character to embrace. I think he is. He must yeah. be very hard for you. How'd you get a handle on him? I, well, I just chose to just stand like the guys did a long time ago and just say the lines, you know? Just, just stand and deliver. Uh, I didn't write this, this script. I believed in it. Uh, there were problems that I had because I thought, you know, where's the, where's the toughness? But you know what? It does. It comes out of, uh, it comes out of honesty, his toughness. Well, one of the good things about your character, of course, is that he grows. He changes in the movie. It's not one of these movies where the guy's the same for two hours and right. you go home, you know? Right. And one of the reasons this character changes is because Sean Connery, who plays a cop who is on your side, sort of you really teaches you and, and makes you change. You see what I'm saying? What are you prepared to do? Everything within the law. And then what are you prepared to do? If you open the ball on these people, Mr. Nash, you must be prepared to go all the way. Because they won't give up the fight until one of you is dead. I want to get Capone. I don't know how to get him. Sean Connery is, is a, a great character who does teach me the ropes. Americans seem to have a, a split personality about gangsters. In one way, they know they're supposed to not like these guys. On the other hand, they're absorbed. Right. They love to see gangsters. Capone is almost a hero. He was a right. loathsome creep. I mean, who killed people? He was. Blew up children, and yet everybody wanted to invite him to the party, you know? Right. What is the attraction of gangsters to the American public? Well, they, they usually dress better than <laughs> most of us. And in our picture, they look fabulous. They look fabulous. I mean, we're in Armani clothes, and they said, the good news is the gangsters look fabulous, and the bad news is you're in grays. <laughs> but ultimately, I'm really happy I was in this movie. I, I saw it the other night, and... Uh, and I was uh, very pleased with the fact that it is a, it's worth six bucks, you know? It's all on the screen. All yeah. the money they spent on that movie is up there for you to see. Yeah, it is. You were in the big chill, except you were not in the big chill. Right. First of all, your character's dead to begin with, right. but then there was a big flashback scene, yeah. and it was on a cutting room floor, so we never see you on screen in a big chill, and yet everybody's telling me that the big break that Kevin Costner had was, he was, or was not, in the big chill. Explain that to me. Well, I, I think that uh, there's certain kind of movies you want to be in in your career, and there's certain kind of people you want to work with. And the, I think the great directors and the great actors, they, they look, look to each other's films, and they want to know who was in them by association. But the fact that you weren't on screen, it's still an important credit for you. I, 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 it is. I, I mean, I'm kind of romantic about film and, and, and film lore. And I feel like uh, I'm, I'm part of that. I, I haven't turned up on a Trivial Pursuit question yet, but I, uh, th uh, there's a special place for me being in the Big Chill, uh, being even considered, you know, in that situation. It's going to be a big hit, the picture you're in now. The Untouchables. I, it reminded me of a, of, a, of, a, of a movie I wait for, and then I go in, and it doesn't disappoint. Thank you very, very much for being with us. Thank you. What a great movie, The Untouchables. And again, we want to wish a very happy birthday to Mr. Kevin Costner. And if you're not watching Yellowstone on Paramount+, Plus, that's a great one, too. That's going to wrap up today's Popstar Plus. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. Hope you have a great day. So long. It looks like your standard social setting with hands grasping glasses of beer that have names like this. I'm drinking the Main Cascade Wet Hop IPA. Or this. So I'm drinking the new Raspberry Lime Rattler right now. 
Typical beer lingo with an unexpected twist. It's the full taste experience, the full social experience, just without the alcohol. No alcohol, and yet. Does it taste like beer? It does taste like beer. Absolutely, good beer. <laughs> Are they surprised by it? For sure. Great tasting non-alcoholic beer is definitely an oxymoron. Such low expectations didn't stop Bill Schufelt and John Walker from creating Athletic Brewing Company in 2017. After Bill, then a hedge fund trader, realized he just felt better when he didn't drink alcohol night after night. Still, something was missing. And without a true beer you were proud of to have in your hand, I felt like such an outsider. And I'd made this positive life choice, but was put in this penalty box all of a sudden. So he teamed up with John, who spent 17 years brewing alcoholic beer. Bottom line, this looks like any other brewery, right? It does. Yeah, traditional brew house, traditional cellar, traditional packaging line. John said he'd only go to market with something that tasted like the craft beers he had been making his whole career. We took about nine, ten months to actually do hundreds of batches to find our process and what actually tasted good. And does it taste good now? It tastes excellent. Rather than just take his word, there we go. John offered me a taste test. Tastes oh. just like a beer. That's the goal. They don't just make one beer, but dozens of styles, from crisp goldens to dark stouts, hoppier IPAs, and seasonal flavors, too. More options to meet the growing demand, from pregnant women to those who are giving up alcohol for a few days, a month, or longer. I came into this world through the road of recovery. I quit drinking four years ago, and I opened it, I cracked it, and I was just like, thank you. <laughs> in recent years, big beer brands like Heineken, Stella Artois, and Budweiser have all unveiled non-alcoholic options. It's believed the global market will grow from $923 million in 2020 to more than $1.7 trillion by 2028. And Athletic is the fastest growing brewery in the country, alcoholic or not, two years in a row. What do you think is the future of non-alcoholic beer? I think it's gonna continue to grow, you know, as more and more people realize that this can taste delicious, just as good as alcoholic beer, but you can maintain your life a little better. A brewing business that's no beer bust. For today, Joe Fryer, NBC News, Stratford, Connecticut. Okay, very cool. Should All we right, try it's these? It's 21 a.m. somewhere, so, huh? What do you say we do this? <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. 0.5% alcohol. Peter's not the biggest drinker. I'm a lightweight, I acknowledge, but. This is the most alcohol he's had in quite some time. That's not bad. Don't chug it, Peter. You're going to be tipsy. <laughs> my bad, my bad. Well, that's going to be a good way to that's start the day. That's good, actually. That's, yeah, that's very good. good. Yeah. Yeah, it tastes like, it does taste like beer. I think that's the bottom you line. You keep talking, I'll yeah. keep drinking. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All yeah, right, it is the The Today Show's newest fan. Al Roker. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it's love that. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's a sisterhood of restaurants with a purpose, run by young women, finding inspiration in their own stories. Chef Zyla Cadillo taps into her Mexican heritage to create her cuisine. My restaurant is Etheria. It is a mezcal bar with vegan-inspired Mexican dishes. Chef Shinari Freeman leans into her southern roots for recipes. My restaurant is called Cadence. It is southern soul food, plant-based focus. 
And Chef Amara Garib, daughter of an Ecuadorian mother and an Egyptian father, gets her inspiration from her father, who operated a pizza parlor. My restaurant is called Soda Club. It's a wine bar, and it's plant-based uh, Italian fresh pasta. Did you catch this detail? All three skip the animal products, but not the flavor. Look, okay, I have to say, when you hear Italian food, when you hear Mexican food, when you hear soul food, I mean, there's a lot of cheese in those. There's a lot of meat in those. I'm Mexican. I grew up with my mom making Mexican food. How is it to make these particular types of food plant-based? For soul food, one thing you have to definitely focus on is the flavor profile. So just playing around with textures a lot, uh, different flavors, cooking techniques. I think the Italian food, you just stick with fresh pasta, you can't go wrong. Mexican people are indigenous people, and a lot of our food is from nature and from the gum. So I feel like it easily translated to being vegan. Raise your hand if you're a vegan. Okay, so Mira, you're not. What was this process like? I mean, were you like missing the cheese at all on top of a pasta or no? It's really easy to just cover something in cheese and it's delicious <laughs> and then it tastes good. <laughs> yeah, it was more challenging because I was just trying to find substitutes to make it more traditional, but not traditional at the same time. We yeah. also have a group chat where one of us will be like, this is a whack cheese, don't use it. Or this <laughs> yeah. is a really good one, you should try it out, stuff like that. You're all under 30 and you have the titles of executive chef at restaurants in New York City. I mean, how cool is that? <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> How's this been to go through together? Better than going alone. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. We're able to learn a lot from each other mm. um, and also learn a lot about ourselves, how we cook, and how to run restaurants. Their boss had full faith they could do just that. Ravi DeRossi, founder and CEO of Overthrow Hospitality, who owns all the restaurants, decided to give them a shot at starting their own culinary concepts when they were working at the company in different positions. Was it this purposeful decision to give three women of color this opportunity to be executive chefs of New York City restaurants? I think subconsciously intentional, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. They were already in the company and the best suited for these positions. Over 65% of our 300 some odd employees were women and people of color. So we made the very clear decision to put more people of color in places of authority. So as they're hiring, they see through the lens of their selves. Of course, a taste test had to be part of this assignment to see how they stand up to the real thing. First, plant-based Italian from the Soda Club. So where should I start? Definitely with the ravioli. With the ravioli, okay. That's my favorite, yeah. That is amazing. You good? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm having a moment. Next, vegan-inspired Mexican food from Eteria. The mango salsa looks delicious. It was so good. Oh my goodness. And finally, I had to try a dish getting rave reviews. Fried lasagna, a soul food favorite at Cadence. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm blown away. Sign me up. <laughs> I know, right now, all three women say they come up with these innovative recipes by doing their research, which really just means getting to go out to eat a lot. And oh, they all say I'm they're there. more focused on the flavor and mm -hmm. the texture rather than just making sure that it mimics non-vegan food. And I have to say, when I was eating that, it's not like I was eating vegan dishes. I was just eating great food. Yeah, see, mm. I think that's the mistake a lot of people make. Is like, don't make it like it's like this. Right. Just make it that what it, it is. is what it is. I agree it's just that. Celebrate food. that. And it happens to be made with some things that you might not be used to eating. I think the texture. this is the way of the future. Yeah. I think you're always on trend. We're all in. There we I go. Think we'll see more of these around the country where you live perhaps too. Thanks, all right, Savannah. it's easy to be Thank vegan you, if there's these great options. you got a plane to catch. Yeah, yeah I, I do. I know. You got we'll see this. if I make it. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Oh, no. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There's some late breaking news for hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just did week-long journey across America from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show. Oh,
in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you what you must know. The biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it is the Our week long journey across America from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? I'm on a mission to get to the NBA. I'm ready. I'm ready to work. Jalen Lewis has always been a dreamer. How long have you known you wanted to be a professional basketball player? I'll say since I was three. Since I really, like, started figuring out the game, I knew it was for me. And the game's been good to him. Mm. The Oakland native is 6'9", number two in his draft class, and at 16 years old already, one of the hottest young players in the country. I've heard that you're decent on the court. I can make a few shots, I'm all right. But Jalen's forging a new path to the pros. He's giving up his high school and college eligibility to play for Overtime Elite, a brand new basketball league for the world's top 16 to 19 year olds. The inaugural class of 27 players are considered pros because they're paid to play. Contracts start at $100,000 a year. Jalen's multi-year contract is reportedly worth a million dollars. He's now the youngest professional basketball player in U.S. history. It's a lot of money. It is. It's like something that no one has really done at 16. That's why I seize the opportunity. It's life changing. Yeah. Jalen and his new teammates live and train in Atlanta. They're split into three groups of nine and will play elite prep schools in each other through a 37 game season with international play expected next spring. When the athletes aren't at practice, they're in class learning about financial literacy, social activism, mental health, and the business of basketball. So are we teaching them to be businessmen or, or basketball players? All of the above. All of the above. All of the above. OTE leadership is uniquely qualified to understand the importance of both. The three I talked to have a combined 70 years of coaching, playing, and executive experience in the NBA and NCAA. Why was it so important to allow the guys to profit off their, their likeness and their name? A lot of younger players, especially some of the, the newer stars in the league, got their start connecting with Overtime's fans and building community online. And so how could we, of all organizations, not acknowledge that value in the form of a contract? And they've caught the attention of some impressive investors. Drake, Jeff Bezos, Carmelo Anthony, Kevin Durant few dozen NBA players. Why do you think so many of these men and women have decided to pony up so much money? You have professional athletes, you have entrepreneurs, you have musicians, all people who excel at what they do and have, in many cases, taken alternative paths. They see themselves in this opportunity. Drake didn't have to go to the Berkeley School of Music. He was quite fine without it. So the idea is to produce NBA players. That is certainly a major goal for us. We want to see as many of them as possible in the NBA because that's every kid's dream. A dream that Jalen Lewis is more than ready to make real in a few years. For now, though, he's enjoying being 16. That means talking to girls, playing video games, and debating basketball legends. Greatest player ever. It's not a trick question. I'm just going to go with LeBron James. LeBron? Yeah. How many championships does he have? Four, right? How many does Mike have? He got six. Right. You need to teach the kids some history of basketball, coach. We decided to settle things where else? On the court. Oh, I'm pulling it. I wouldn't even warm yet. Hang on. What are you going to do? Oh! Oh. Come on, overtime. Oh, yeah. now he's showing off, coach. Yeah, what's the back down game? Oh, I'm in there again. You dribble too much. Oh! Oh! oh. 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 <laughs> How about we call it a draw? Yeah. Okay. Damn. Oh, yeah. I'm out of breath. Oh, oh oxygen. You lost three to one, and wow. you were exhausted. I, I did. <laughs> yeah. We only played for five pulled minutes. Hammy. And the kid, the, 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 <laughs> yeah, he's number two in the country. Yeah. Uh, OTE season, by the way, kicked off this weekend. They played a few prep schools uh, at home in Atlanta. No surprise, they won all of their games. Also, no surprise to anyone that Jalen, uh, he put up twenty points 
in his first game. What you would call a draw. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So this is, I mean, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind yeah, around. It right. It's such a new concept. But, I mean, the NCAA is going to start paying yes. players. So does right. that make it a harder sell? I mean, it seems like the big pull for, for players to not go college route is to get paid yeah. at the yes. CE. Yes. And some players in the NCAAs, when they change the rules, don't make money. Everyone in this league makes money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The minimum size are hundred thousand dollars, and they can cash in on their, their their name and likeness. And of course, the flip side though is you 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 can't go to college. Yeah. So what happens then? I mean, the, the the thinking is that most of these kids, if not all of these kids, either end up in the NBA or they play overseas. They play internationally. These are these are the best kids around the country. The bigger question is going to come into play, I think, in a couple of years from now, when you've got the the blue chip programs, your Dukes, your UNCs. Mm -hmm. right. They're now competing with the overtime elites mm -hmm. and right. other programs like this for mm -hmm. top talent. So there it are makes some sense though. Kevin Garnett, Kobe Bryant, uh, LeBron. The list goes on. If people came right out of high school, yeah, true. So right. that pathway is not. But uh, but how many of them to see. of those caliber players are these kids? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the for its part, the NBA, they're okay with it right yeah. now. Okay. So. Right. right. Interesting. That's cool. Interesting. <laughs>
<laughs> I forever I've been the youngest competitor, so um, so that was a big change. Um, I kind of wear it proudly now, though. You know, mm-hmm. you got amazing athletes like Tom Brady, and um, you, you know sure. th- that are yep. that are getting into their older years and and still holding it down. So I'm 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 feeling good about it. I like the the inspiration from the others, and um, and it's so exciting for me. I, I was kind of tripping out the other day just thinking about you know there's this magic moment when you make the team you're like wow i get to be an olympian again just to go is so incredible so um one step at a time gonna try to make the team and then uh set the sights on uh china i love it sean you always make us smile i mean every time we talk with you you're just such a good guy and this is a guy she age truly is just a number yeah because you 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 make it and and you make us all proud. And so, as, as the oldest guy on this Olympic team, yeah, <laughs> I can tell you, yeah. you, just, you, you, you keep the youngins on your toes, my friend. Sean yeah, White. Yeah, right. That's the goal. We, <laughs> we will see well, you. Hopefully we'll see you guys and uh, see you all in China. Yeah. No, hopefully, no, hopefully about it. We will see you in Beijing. We know you'll be there. Sounds good. Uh, and again, as Al pointed out, you always make us so proud. So, Oh, and by the way, folks, Thank in case you, you hadn't heard, uh, you can catch... All the action of the Winter Olympics. Al, oh, there's the music. There. All the action starting February 3rd on the networks of NBC I love it. and Peacock. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last movie. <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? The Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast, free wherever you get your podcasts. No celebration would be complete without one of Team USA's biggest names. We're talking about Michaela Schifrin. She is a superstar, (laughs) two-time Olympic gold medal winner. She has big plans for the Games, big goals, and she's already off to an incredible start. She won the giant (laughs) slalom, won it in the season opening World Cup event just last weekend. Michaela, you're off and running. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. (laughs) So, I mean, there's a long time in skiing terms between now and the Olympics. Mm -hmm. But you do have big goals. What are they? Oh, yeah, big, <laughs> big old goals. Those goals, they'll, they'll get you every time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am, right now I'm a little bit focused on the World Cup season, but, I mean, your eyes always set a little bit on the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And uh, after coming back from Solden and winning the first race, I feel like it was, it's like the first check mark on my journey to hopefully be able to compete in every event at the games. That's hopefully wait, compete every, in every, every event, event, every alpine games. skiing event. No, well, that's that's but a Michaela, big deal. only you could even consider that yeah. as a potential right. because you excel in, in mm-hmm. both kinds of ski racing. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's there's six six alpine events total and I wanted to do that in South Korea. Uh, mm-hmm. I actually wanted to ski in five events in South Korea, and it a, a lot of things happened that just made it not mm-hmm. possible. Um, and it looks like, you know, it, it might be some difficult weather in, in Beijing. We'll mm-hmm. see. Mm-hmm. But I think with anything I learned from South Korea is that you just have to roll with the punches. And Well, there are a lot of, there are a lot of cool things about you. One <laughs> of them is you say that you are not defined by your success. I mean, I feel like you're a really grounded human being. Like, oh. if you don't have a great day... <laughs> So what? Like, you seem like you are secure in what you do. So when you're getting ready to go down and do one of your runs, like, what's what's kicking through your head at that moment? Oh, I... 
I was just trying to focus on my skiing as, yeah. as much as possible because there, there are some athletes who are so driven just to win that just their, their motivation to win alone is what actually gets them to the finish line faster. But for me, it's always been about good skiing and like the turns that I make along the way. So I don't know, it's a little bit like that metaphorical. It's, it's the journey, not the end destination, mm -hmm, yeah. but it's true for me. That's how I've always had my best races just Skiing well. Mm -hmm. and, and just in case people, you know, last they checked in with you, you were winning gold four years <laughs> ago, at, excuse me, five years ago at the Olympics, and now here you are winning again in your most recent <laughs> mm -hmm. race. In between, you've had incredible challenges. Mm -hmm. You lost your father. Mm -hmm. You've dealt with anxiety mm -hmm. and, and the stress of, uh, of that, mm -hmm. and then a pandemic to boot. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling, and how mm -hmm. has that journey been for you? Um... Well, I guess it's just, it's been life. And yeah. I think everybody's dealing with something. I, you know, we're all dealing with the pandemics. That's one thing we all have in common. Um, for me personally and my family, dealing mm -hmm. with uh, unexpected death of my dad was the most difficult thing I've ever survived. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, it's okay. Like, it's okay to talk about it. Um, I think it's been over the last couple of years. It's been important to talk about, and a lot of people actually seem to be able to relate to that on some level. Because aside from the pandemic, everybody's dealing with something on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and there's a lot of like loss and grief and sadness out there. But there's also a lot of strength and hope. And I think it's important for us to all be able to connect on the more positive side of it. And you like really that. personify yeah, that. You do. After, after your dad passed, did you think about whether or not you would ski again? Was that something that you thought about? Yeah, I did. I, I wondered if it was really worth it. Um, I mean, there's a really long time that I didn't really feel like it was worth it to care about anything. So it mm. seemed like I'm not going to go s ski race again because the, ba the most fundamental thing of an athlete is that you have to care about your sport and mm -hmm. you have to care about doing well at your mm -hmm. sport. And I just didn't. I just thought mm -hmm. I don't care about actually really anything in life. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it, it's been a, a long process to get that motivation and that f actually the feeling of caring back. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I, <laughs> a lot more good days than bad yeah. now, but... It's still difficult. It's not sure. easy to talk about, but I'm yeah. so glad you did because yes. I want people to know what a triumph it <laughs> yeah. is. What you just did last weekend, yeah. what you're setting out to do. Thanks. It's a triumph yeah. in every single way, yeah. just you being here. You guys are going to make me cry. No, but it. I just, um, you yes. know, so Thanks. you're also a huge, I just want to say before you go, I love that you're a huge fan of the Olympics and I heard that, actually I heard you, we were in Tokyo, we yeah. heard you screaming for the athletes all the way yes. back in the U.S. Yes. You're a huge me. fan. Do you mm -hmm. watch, I heard you taped the Olympics and then would watch them yeah. later. Yeah, we were taping everything and then we had it going <laughs> streaming on Peacock and like always in the background and um, the the gym I work out back home at the Westin is, um, they always had it on in multiple TV screens. So yeah. I'm doing my squats and I'm looking up and I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I'm like, one more breath. Well, oh you can God. guarantee that they're gonna be watching you doing yes. the exact same thing. Well, Michaela, we are cheering we you are. on. Congratulations, you. so happy you're here with us. Go get them. Suni Lee, the US women's gymnastics superstar is marking her stellar run in Tokyo where she won three medals in a pretty permanent way. Check it out. Suni shared this picture on her Instagram story. Nice. She did it. Of her in what appears to be a tattoo parlor with the Olympic rings right there on her forearm, and the caption did a thing. <laughs> now, it's pretty common for Olympians to celebrate their accomplishment. With some fresh ink, teammate Simone Biles got her Olympics tattoo after she brought home five medals at the Rio Games in 2016. And I feel like, you know, so often... What do you want to get a tattoo of? What's really important to you? But if you come home with medals from the Olympics, it's like a no-brainer. Yeah, I like where she put it, too. It's subtle. It's cool. You mm -hmm. a tattoo girl? I do. If I win a gold medal in the Olympics, I will get a tattoo. <laughs> Is that a promise? Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, we may have to be a little patient. <laughs> I've got the giant eagle here. Oh, does uh -huh. it wrap around the back? You know, yeah. Actually, sorry, that's Caleb Dressel. No, but it, it looked cool on him. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, 
the city of Baltimore is serious about his crib. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomping ground of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty, and savory, all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can't. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you got to think Blue Crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices and you just start whacking that bad boy and you can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Good to see you. How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley's Seafood for years, but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five pants and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. You know, it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back? Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886. Started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine along with their daughter. Dami Han, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of, of everything. 
going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone, running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you did you think you were gonna end up here? You were gonna be doing this? No, <laughs> no, but it was hard to get away from and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents, so. The pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. <laughs> which should be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm gonna say it's been around 33, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, a uh, week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. It's, what's Mom. really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> Just a few of them, you know? Just a few. While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Soybean. Soybean, thank you. So excited to have this crab cake. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's, it belongs on a silver platter. Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's Crab Cake recipe? I sleep with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs. You use it's crushed broken up saltines. Salty, broken saltines, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so, and then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the Mine big is. ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. This. Oh boy. Oh. It was just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. 
Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Just call when you need them most. Ooh, let it go. The Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well, he grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman, and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather, and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. For hundreds of years, they've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There was more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole east coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? This morning it looked pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do, and got nobody to tell you go get me this or go get me that. Seventy-five-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, I was bay 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and 
I, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black watermen, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it'll be no chance no more black watermen. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught highs 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And it, it, it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up and coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. We began our Cross America journey tonight, St. Louis, Austin. Here in Nashville. From Washington, D.C., the side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. We began our Cross America journey tonight, St. Louis, Austin. Here in Nashville. From Washington, D.C., the site of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? journey across America from Washington, D.C., a site of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? Some late breaking news for hours into the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just made it. Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez, I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. 
I'm an artist at heart. So uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a uh, family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I'm just always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha. My big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that are people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know? Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crap. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Prince. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news for hours since the Iowa caucuses by the family of Everton. All right, it just did too. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. And what I know, I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. So you're able to add a little bit. Yeah. But he's always asked me uh, when I fix a dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do? How did you do this? And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, 
egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right, patience ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you wanna do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> this sauce particular is our, our crab sauce mix. So we're gonna drizzle a little bit at a time. Cause I don't wanna put too much, right. just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Yep, I think I'll have enough. She's, she's stay by me. I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about you know when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Gonna start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a, a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on, on the go. Uh -huh. You know, it's throwing your hand. Kind of a street food. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's, it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right. Well, exactly. You know. <laughs> yeah, because you can take it with you, but if it's not right. tasty, right. Right. Exactly. Uh, come back for it. Yeah. So what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. It's around like a yeah, quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. They're gonna sit in the middle. Is that too yep. much? Yeah, we wanna take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we wanna put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. Right, perfect, sorry. perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna literally fold them up envelope style. When, what is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Hey, yeah. is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that, <laughs> bam, done. It faster than what I did. Wow. <laughs> Wow, the natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! You had to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my my story, and uh, I think that connects very well to our Baltimore. You know because. You know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life. And I think everything that um, I faced during the time that, you know, I, I started this company up until now, I've been transparent about that. And it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore. And they, they watched my journey through the years. And I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and the inside. crisp around the edges and things like that. So that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't uh -huh. fry on one particular side too much. And, want to even fry. Mm. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So, yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made. And this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet. It has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and I try the piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Crab cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Chef Alf, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake, tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true, food tastes better when you eat it with family.
and welcome to On The Money Today. Millions of Americans every year vow to get better and smarter with their New Year's resolutions. They want to eat healthier, exercise more, and lose a couple pounds. Those are all top resolutions we hear year after year, and it's great. It is great to want to improve your physical health, but I'm going to challenge you to think about a different kind of goal, your financial health. Just like you might cut out cookies and add more veggies to your diet, I want you to add more mindfulness to your spending and really reboot your savings habits. Today, we're going to start 2022 off right with my own personal money rules, the three most important financial resolutions to help you gain control of your money. First, if you want to save more and who doesn't, you got to make a budget. And if you want to make a budget you can actually stick to, my money rule, track it. You need to track every single dollar you spend, just like you might track every calorie when you go on a diet. But before you can decide where your money problems are, you've got to track your money so you know where exactly your money is going. It's not hard to do. You can use an app. You can use a notebook. You can put it in the draft of an email. However you can actually get it done, do it. Get the information you need. My next money rule, pay down your debts. And I realize easier said than done, but in order to start paying down your debts, you've got to have a plan. Getting started with that plan is hard, but you need to know exactly what you owe. Go over every single one of your bills, pull them out of the closet, out of that shoebox, figure out your bills, all of your loans, how much you owe to each lender, and most importantly, what the interest rate is on every single bit of that. That's gonna help you figure out a game plan and help you save on those torturous fees that none of us like paying. And my last one, how are we going to spend less? And I don't mean fewer dollars, I mean spending less on the stuff that doesn't actually matter. All of us are guilty of spending when we're tired, when we need a mood boost, any number of reasons, impulse buying, emotional spending. This is the year we're gonna stop that. I wanna challenge you to spend more mindfully, shop smart, and really give each dollar a purpose. And you're in luck. I have gathered a team of superstar experts to help you make a plan for each one of these resolutions. And, and I wanna start with someone extra special. Ashley Feinstein Gersley. She's the author of Financial Adulting. She is here to help us create a budget. Ashley, we need this help because it's easy to say, oh, make a budget, but nobody does it because creating a budget is a lot like doing a chore and nobody likes a chore. I know you have an inspiring way to do this. A lot of people are going, there's no such a thing. There's no inspirational budget, but you've got one. So walk us through it. You're 100% right. Budgets need a reframe. And that's why I call budgets happiness allocations. I think it's a much better way to describe them because they're just a plan for how we're going to strategically allocate our money in the way that's going to make us the happiest. I agree with you. If you're going to have a beautiful home, you need a great foundation. You need the best architect, and that's you. So for those who have never done it, how do you go about creating a budget? Is there a certain equation we should use? I. So we start with the budgeting equation, which is our income, the amount that hits our bank account, and we subtract our expenses and our goals. And then we have what's left over. And if what's left over is positive, then that's great. Our budget is working. But if we take our income minus our expenses and our goals and it's negative, then our budget's not currently workable or our income is not able to cover our expenses and goals. Here's one of the issues. A lot of times we don't include lots of our spending in a budget. And then at the end of the month, we've got a huge credit card bill or we have no money left and we can't figure out how that happened because when we created that budget, we only had our insurance, our rent, our car payments, and it didn't include all the other stuff we spend on. Definitely. And I think it's really easy to leave things for a budget. I almost view it as a living document. We're always going to be updating it. We'll have lifestyle changes, but we tend to leave out the little things and those can add up, especially if they're happening in a bunch of different categories and over months. And we also have this optimistic tendency to round down and mm -hmm. it could be rounding down to the dollar, mm -hmm. rounding down to the $10 or just estimating. So as exact as we can be with our budget, by looking back on the last 12 months of what we've been spending, strategically thinking about what's happening different this year, the more our budget will reflect reality. Okay, that's the framework. Take us to the emotion. Let's say we have created the budget, but something that's really hard to do is sticking to it. Whether it's going out for a meal, getting a coffee, buying new clothes, those things aren't in our budget and we can often bust that budget. So do you have any tips to sticking to it? 
Yes, sticking to it is so important because it's actually the key to budgeting success. So first, let's keep it realistic, even though it will be optimistic. If we are cutting things out cold turkey or drastically cutting our expenses, we're setting ourselves up for failure. So we want to make realistic changes. We want to keep it simple. If it's too complicated, it's going to be tedious and too much work to keep it up. We also want to create time to actually sit down and work on our budget. And I call this time a money party, which budgeting gets a reframe. So do our money meetings. Get cozy, put on some music, have your favorite beverage and spend some time budgeting. And then I'd say the last tip I have and probably the most important tip is to be kind to ourselves. As financial adults, we're always learning and growing. We're going to make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. So we just want to be kind to ourselves as we're growing and learn from those mistakes. Realistic, optimistic, and kind. If that's not a great way to start the year, I don't know what is. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for these tips. I know I certainly need them. Coming up, if you are paying down debt on credit cards or student loans, you don't wanna go anywhere. This segment is for you. You're gonna need this one. Stay with us. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just is. Hey there, I'm Stephanie Rule, and welcome back to On The Money. We're taking a look at our top three financial resolutions for 2022. Number two on our list, paying down debt. Tackling debt can be so daunting, but Danielle Villalobos and her husband are proof that hard work and dedication can pay off. My name is Danielle Villalobos. I live in Denver, Colorado with my husband and our two dogs, and we are in the process of paying off over $100,000 in debt. We had student loans, medical debt, credit card debt, our two cars, and our mortgage. We were stressed out about money all the time. Debt is really sneaky. We didn't know that you have to pay more than the minimum in order to pay it off. In July of 2018, my husband's best friend passed away. He was the best man at our wedding and was the greatest human. Um, and three days after his funeral, I lost my job that caused us to take serious pause. That same week I jumped on a call with an old friend of mine and she asked me the most important question I think anyone has ever asked me. And it was, where do you want to be in five years? You're at this rock bottom, where do you want to be? And my husband and I talked about it. We decided where we wanted to be. And we said, how are we going to get there? And the first thing that we had to do was get our finances. I read all the money books just to try and figure out where we even started. I had to track all the money that was going out. And I did that for three months until we could figure out what our budget could actually be without us completely cutting everything out. The biggest challenge is just to stick with it. It gets really hard because there were a lot of times, a lot of things we wanted to do that we had to say no to. And it's been very worth it. We've gotten it down to about 40,000. Right now, our goal is to finish 2022 completely debt-free and have our investments ready to go going into 2023. 
When I think about where we were when we started and where we are now, I feel really excited. I was 18 when I got my first student loan and 18 years later, I'll pay it off. I've had debt as long as I haven't had debt and I'm excited to see the person that I am without it. Debt free by 2023 is awesome, Danielle, but I wanna get realistic because a lot of people are watching saying, great, she did it. I have no idea how I'm going to, so I want to bring in an expert money coach, Lynette Califani cox She's here with some tips on how you can start to own your debt-free journey. Lynette, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, great, here's an expert. What do they know? Right. But you've been in this position. At one point, you were $100,000 in credit card debt. How did you get there and how did you get out? I got into there by classic overspending. Just when I saw something, if I wanted it, I just went out and bought it and didn't give regard to how I was gonna pay it off. Ultimately, I had to tally up everything and take a good hard look in the mirror and see what I owed. And then I started to chip away at the debt. So I did so many things to get out of the debt, not the least of which was recognizing that minimum payments were a trap. Mm -hmm. So I started doubling and tripling my payments because I now know that minimum payments in the short run mean long payments in the long run, a lot of interest. And then I did other things too. I put windfalls, income tax refund checks, bonuses from the job, socked everything towards the debt. Okay, so today we're gonna focus on credit card debt and yes. student loan debt. I wanna start with credit card debt. Yes. You say the first step is simply knowing what you owe. In yes. theory, we all know what we owe, but we don't. We, we, really spend, we spend, we spend, but we don't actually look at those bills. We, we really don't know. One thing I've learned as a money coach over the past 18 years is that most people guesstimate they put their bills in the shoebox or mm -hmm. in the drawer. They don't really check it out. You have to pull out every single one and know exactly how much debt you owe. You should know the interest rate. You should know the amount of the dollar balances. You should know the minimum payments required. And you should really have a plan about how am I going to tackle this stuff? Because if you don't, you'll be mired in debt month after month, year after year. People often think, hey, this credit card is available to me. That must mean I can afford it. But that's not the case. No. And standard practice is, well, you got all your bills, start paying off whatever is the highest interest rate. That's what I always thought to do. Right. Is that not the case? I don't believe that that's always the best strategy, frankly. I know this is counterintuitive wisdom here. Yeah, I get yeah, Let me tell you something. I hate paying high interest rates. I, I hate know. paying fees. If I understand that. And if you have those high fees, you should definitely try to negotiate, which is one of my strategies. You can negotiate for a whole bunch of things. You can negotiate for partial payments, to extend your payment date, to change your payment date, to have a late payment on your credit report updated. Obviously, you can negotiate, and most people don't do that. Okay, but you cannot negotiate if you don't know what you owe. Right. If all those bills are sitting in the back of your closet, then you are not on the phone with your loan officer Absolutely. creating a plan. Absolutely. And asking for that lower rate. But here's the thing. If you don't worry about interest rates, because like me, when I had $100,000 in credit card debt, I actually had very low interest rates. So I was more bothered by high dollar balances. So for those folks who are maxed out and their credit cards are at their limits, you might be better served by going after the cards with the highest dollar balance first and attacking those, reducing those dollar balances so you won't be so close to the edge. Here's a problem I'm worried about. We've had a, a freeze because of COVID accommodations on student, student loan payments. Yes. And in theory, we should have been trying to save up knowing we were going to have to start paying, but a lot of us didn't do that. Right. What do we need to know? How do we need to prepare? Because those bills are coming. You definitely need to also know what you owe. You need to make sure that you understand, do I have federal loans? Do I have private loans? And then you need to understand what are the payment or repayment options available to you. Generally speaking on the federal student loan re uh, repayment front, there's kind of like three main categories. There's the standard loan repayment program where you pay them off in, in 10 years. There's a graduate or extended loan repayment options. They might take you out to 20 or 25 years. And then there's a variety of income-based or income-sensitive loan repayment options. So you need to find the program that best fits your situation. Last thing, I want you to give us some tips on understanding how credit works, right? So lots of people say, oh, I'm gonna buy this cruise because you know they're having a discount on it. I'm gonna buy these boots because they're on sale. But if you're only making minimum payments and if you've got high interest, those boots ain't on sale, you end right. up paying two, three times retail. We don't realize that. Right. Can you help us understand why knowing credit is important? 
Well, credit and debt are actually two opposite sides of the same coin, mm -hmm. especially with your credit card debt because the more credit card debt you're carrying, the more that tends to drag down your FICO credit score. Thank you. 30% of your FICO credit score is based on the amount of debt that you have outstanding. And also, if you wanna take that cruise or go shopping or whatever, if you take out new forms of credit, that's an inquiry that gets generated on your credit report, stays on there for uh, two years, counts against you for the purpose of your FICO score for 12 months, again, that lowers your credit rating as well. So you have to be mindful of your credit and spending, especially your credit card usage behaviors, that can drag down your credit score. Just because you can swipe doesn't mean you, you should. should. <laughs> it is a trap, be aware of it. Thank you so much. These are such important tips. We need them, yes. especially going into a big new year. That's Annette right. Califani Cox, you made us definitely a whole lot better and smarter. Coming up next, how to shop smart and spend less on everyday essentials from gas to groceries and more. And later in the show, is 2022 your year to start investing? We'll show you the best online tools to get in on the action right after the break. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it what's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today Show's newest fan. A little Al Roker. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the man from the Richard. All right, it just made it. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey there, welcome back to On The Money. I'm Stephanie Rule, and there is no time like the present to make financial resolutions for the new year. We've made our budget, We've made a plan for paying down debt. Now it's time to take a look at how we can cut everyday spending. Here to help, nerd wallet finance expert Kimberly Palmer. Kim, you say there are two things we should wait to buy, electronics and clothing. I'll give it to you. I have a, I have a closet full of almost the identical dress, so I can wait on clothing. But why electronics? Well, electronics is really tough right now because we're still seeing a lot of supply chain issues. And what that means is that there just isn't the inventory for retailers to offer the kind of discounts that we're used to seeing. So it really is best to wait if you do have that flexibility for things like TVs, video game consoles, computers. But if you absolutely cannot wait and you need to buy now, there are still ways to find discounts. You just have to work a little harder and put a little more effort in. I get that dollar stores are a great solution for things like toys for kids, wrapping paper, stationery, paper goods. But then you've got groceries and gas. Gas is one that I've never known how you can save on gas. It is what it is. 
Gas is a tough one. The first question to ask yourself is if you can possibly drive less right now. So for example, maybe you can start carpooling. Maybe you can even take heavy things out of your trunk. That can actually really help stretch each gallon of gas. And then also gas prices vary so much, even within a neighborhood. So if you can, you want to use an app like Gas Buddy to make sure you're going to the gas station that will give you the best price possible. Another option, if you're someone that pays off your credit card balance every month, consider using something like a gas rewards card because then you can earn cash back. Another way to help stretch your budget. We know that almost everything at the grocery store has gotten a lot more expensive, but are there certain items that have been impacted the most by supply chain issues and shortages? Because those are the things that maybe we can avoid. Grocery prices really have gone up across the board, but there are some categories that have just really spiked. So for example, packaged snacks are very steep right now. So our bakery products, cereals. One thing we recommend at NerdWallet is to make sure you're layering discounts on top of each other. So for example, at your local grocery store, maybe you can opt into the loyalty program to get discounts. Then on top of that, you could use a grocery rewards card to get extra cash back. It's a way of stretching your budget because prices are just so high. Okay, those packaged snacks, that's exactly where we're seeing shrinkflation. It's a huge topic among consumers. A lot of people haven't heard the word, but we're experiencing it. I took a snack out for my daughter the other day. I thought it was for a Barbie doll. It was so small. Can you explain this to us and how we can avoid it? Shrinkflation is such a challenge right now because it's so sneaky. Basically, mm -hmm. you're paying the same price, but you're getting less. And sometimes it's hard to even notice. So in really subtle ways, uh, basically retailers, manufacturers have made it smaller what you're actually opening up inside the package. You have to look so carefully at how it's labeled. And also it's harder to compare prices too. So you want to be really careful about looking at that per unit price when you're making comparisons and deciding what to buy. So is the answer get away from packaged goods, try to buy bulk and separate it yourself? I mean, that is a great strategy, but I'm, I'm a mama three and I know how hard it is because it means you have to put more effort in. It's so easy to grab those packaged snacks for kids lunches, but it can definitely save you money. But again, you have to put that extra work in. Teeny tiny packaging, big, big prices. We see you manufacturers and we're not buying it. Kimberly, thank you for joining us. Thank you for these tips. And a lot of people in the last year have actually said, hold on a second, I've saved. During COVID, they weren't spending going out. Disposable income actually increased. Household savings went up. And a lot more people have said, maybe it's time for me to invest in the stock market. It's a goal for 2022. And it's obvious why. 2021 was a year of all-time highs. But I want you to remember, investing is not a reason to simply get excited because you're having fear of missing out. Right now, there are lots and lots of online options that are making it easier for people to get in on the action. But what's really important is to understand what you're investing in and why. So let's bring in editor-in-chief of Investopedia, Caleb Silver. He's here with some advice on how to get started. Caleb, welcome. I'm, I'm so happy you're here. Over the last year, so much fear of missing out. We have seen the stock market hit record highs, especially just think about the last five or ten years. People are watching the markets saying, I want to get in. And now there are so many technological advances that make it easier to invest. But how should we start thinking about it? Well, great to be with you. And it's never been easier to invest. That doesn't mean it's easy to invest. Bingo. Right? Yes. The technology has made it much easier. The platforms are much easier to use. There's no fees for trading stocks anymore. All kinds of products you can buy as an investor. But you got to do your homework and you have to decide what kind of an investor you want to be. If you have that discretionary income, are you going to be an investor for the long term and try to build wealth? Or are you going to try to get in there and trade the market and try to make money quickly? That's much harder to do and many people fail at that. But investing for the long term is the path to building wealth. Okay, but that's where I want you to go because people say, hey, I've got some extra money, let me invest it. Can you help us understand how important time horizon is? Because just because you've got a few thousand extra dollars doesn't mean you should invest it, especially if you need that money a year from now. Yeah, if you need that money within a year, the stock market's probably not the best place for that to be. Robo-advisors are an option. Can you explain that to us? Sure. Robo-advisors are digital asset managers, and basically they do the work for you of picking the mutual funds or the securities. You put in your goals, you put in your age, you put in your income and your assets, and they help you develop a plan. Set it and forget it. That's for the hands-off investor that just wants to have that money work for them over time.
But there are other options if you don't want that. If you want much more hands-on, you want to make the decisions yourself, do your own research, then maybe you want to consider an online broker. But there's so many options for new investors to get into the market cheaply, efficiently, and then be able to manage their risk over time. Talk about the fees, though. For those who say, I don't have an MBA, I don't have any investing experience, but I can't afford one of those expensive managers, help us understand how the fee structure works. Because when you mentioned before, no fee brokers, people are like, oh my gosh, this is free. It's so easy. None of it is so easy. No, when it's free, you're the customer. But <laughs> it is easy to sign up for an account. You don't have account minimums anymore. You don't have fees for trading. You can add $10 a month. $50 a month, $100 a month. You can start very small and build over time with some of these platforms, and it's easy. You can do it on your mobile phone. You can do it on your desktop. You can work through an actual person if you want an advisor to help you with some of these brokers. But the technology is easier, and the fees are lower, and the access for individual investors has never been better. You just have to do your homework and then think of it as a marathon. This is not something you put in the market and it grows magically. You have to keep adding to it, and you have to keep your eye on it. So my last question, whether it's $100, $1,000, the money we put in the markets, should that be money we, have, we, we can afford to lose? Yeah, absolutely. But you should also expect that over time, it's going to grow. The stock market returns on average somewhere between 6 and 8% a year for the last 60 or 70 years. That may change year to year, but in general, that trend is higher. And the stock market has been a great place to build wealth back in the day and today. Over time, that's what's key. If you need to make that money tomorrow... Go to Vegas. That's at least more fun. Caleb, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Coming up next, are you up for a challenge? We're launching a new on-the-money community to help you reach your financial goals this year. More on that and a look at the headlines impacting your wallet right after this. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news for hours in the Iowa caucuses by the man who never All right, it just did too. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back. Next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Ooh, the answer's when you need them most. Ooh, let it go. The Today Show's newest fan. This is the moment. Little Al Roker. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to On The Money. For many resolutions, it's really helpful to have an accountability buddy. I know I'm way more likely to go to the gym or eat well when there's somebody doing it with me. And that is what we plan to do this month, together. I want you to track your spending alongside the rest of us in the Today community. At today.com slash on the money, you're gonna find a downloadable spending tracker. And each week, you're gonna fill it out. You can do it every time you make a purchase, once a day, every week, whatever works for you. Post your wins. I have got your back and we are all in this together. And I'm gonna be doing a check-in on Instagram in a couple weeks to see how you're doing and I'm gonna tell you how I'm doing. And now let's take a look at the state of the economy as we kick off a new year. The American economy, while it's divided, is in a much better place than we thought we'd be a year ago this time. But that is not to say everything is perfect. Last month, inflation rose by 6.8% from the prior year. That's the biggest jump we've seen since 1982, and 0.8% from October to November. That's the steepest hike we've seen in energy we're seeing the price of used cars and trucks are still really high. Another spot that is not easing up, food. As supply chain issues continue to slow down markets, you're likely going to keep feeling it at the grocery store. But there is a bright spot, a very bright spot, the job market. It might not be ideal for employers, but guess what? For us, 
unemployment and initial jobless claims have dropped in the past few months and job growth is getting higher and higher. 5.8 million jobs were added between November 2020 and November 2021, though it's still nearly 4 million short of pre-pandemic levels. So we are on the path to economic recovery, but it's not a straight line. Thank you for joining me for another edition of On The Money. I am Stephanie Rule, and let's start this new year off right together. Let's get financially fit. First of all, I mean, just raise your hand if you are worried about the mental health of your your husbands this week in light of this news. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. are, And not just not just my husband, but all of the veterans, to be honest. And Sean, you, you raised your hand. You all raised your hands. But Sean, what's it been like having this news come out? How's your husband handling it? He has been absolutely angry. And I think that's um, in, in this space, that's what's hardest to deal with. You know, if he was isolating in his bedroom or, you know, kind of chilling out within himself, yes, that's alarming, but the anger then comes out at those around him, which those around him are myself and, and our daughter. All of your husbands have invisible wounds. I can imagine that this news is even harder when you're dealing with a traumatic brain injury. Has that been your experience, Corinne? Yeah, absolutely. My husband um, was actually injured in Afghanistan while serving. And so for him, the withdrawal coincides with him associating memories of his alive day from being uh, from being blown up. It coincides with the forthcoming, you know, 20th anniversary of 9-11. And so all of these sort of timelines colliding together um, makes it very difficult. I think normally for, for a lot of patients with traumatic brain injury, it's difficult for them to compartmentalize. And so you have all of these things coming together. And for him, it's been very difficult for him not to conflate all of these things and, and um, it's become very difficult. Betsy, what's your experience been with your husband, David? So, you know, my husband, um, his invisible wounds are suicidal ideations. And so when this happened over the weekend, my first instinct as his caregiver was, is he okay? Like, is, is this going to trigger him into a downfall where we end up with him in the emergency room again because of another suicide attempt? So over the weekend, you know, I was on high alert making sure that he is okay. Um, I am very thankful though, that this didn't trigger him in that way. It triggered him in the way that Sean described for her husband, which was the anger. He's very angry and angry at the way it had all unfolded over the weekend in Kabul. And um, so trying to help him navigate through all of that so that he does not become triggered and suicidal again is kind of what we're dealing with here. And are, are your husbands watching the news very closely and? Yeah, my husband is on his phone, checking the Twitter feeds, checking news feeds. He is watching the news all day long. And I think that's because he was so invested for so long in his life in this war that that is the only way he can still feel invested by staying on top of the news and the media. And Sean, is he watching news? Is he talking to, to old buddies? He's watching the news. Um, my husband doesn't do a lot of talking to other veterans, um, which uh, of course is somewhat of the problem, um, not reintegrating into, into what he had before. So it, it's a lot of internal anguish and the news has been on and, and he's paying more attention to the, the social media channels that generally he doesn't. So it's, I think that's what's tough. You know, we want to give them that ability to know what's going on. But at the same time, I think we walk on pins and needles wondering if, okay, when is too much? And 
in social media, we know that the opinions are there. So I think that's where it, it comes in and that anger can can become out of control. And, and I agree with Betsy too. The suicidal ideation is, is huge in our world too. It has been this whole entire past year with COVID. So with something as um, this event in Afghanistan, my husband spent seven tours there. It, it is going to be a triggering event. And I'm just kind of waiting for that. When's that moment going to be? This isn't easy to ask, but are, are you worried this could trigger thoughts of suicide? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I know it already has for him. He has, he talked about it a little bit yesterday. It was more in anger. So for, for his pattern, um, I would rather see the anger than the, the, you know, that flight mechanism that, that starts to take a hold. Um, that's when I know there's going to be a, a bigger crisis. The anger, if he's voicing it, okay, this is good. Um, but absolutely, I'm, I'm wondering if this is going to take him, just like Betsy said, into to the ER at some point in time. Corinne, can you express how he feels about it? Is he worried about those left behind and that those Afghans that helped the, the U.S. soldiers that were there? Or is it more of a feeling of what was it all about? What was it all for? What is the meaning here? I think, uh, I think for Ty, it's a little bit of both. I think it's easy to ask the question, was it worth it? But that's a very difficult and complex conversation to have that I don't think, you know, he's in an emotional state to have yet. For us, it's really more answering the question, did I matter? Did what we did what we did matter? And the, that has been the conversation that we've been trying to have, that even if he doesn't feel like it mattered um, at the sort of larger scale, that to his family, to his friends, to the Marines that he brought home to their families, it certainly mattered. And so it's this, it's the exasperation, it's the frustration, it's the defeatism. Uh, and for him, there's also the, the Marine Association with courage. It feels like we're running away. And that's been really difficult too, because that goes against, right, what they were taught. How about you, Betsy? Is it, is it about that question of, what was, it, was it worth it? Well, it absolutely was over the weekend um, when we saw the fall happen of Kabul and the Taliban really kind of start making their presence known in the capital city. And those were the questions. Um, luckily, though, the great thing about the military community is that we are a family. So you asked about the news and the social media and, and the, the Facebook groups and the, the social places online is where my husband has been interacting with the other veterans. And one thing that has come out of those interactions is similar to what Corinne said, the looking at it as a macro level is a really hard thing to kind of wrap your brain around. But um, we've talked through and he's talked through the, you know, the battles that I were in, those were what mattered. The, um, his comrades that, that gave the ultimate sacrifice, those were what mattered. So it doesn't necessarily matter that we won or lost the war in Afghanistan. And what mattered to my husband was the value that he gave to the fight that he was in at the time that he was in Afghanistan. And so we're really trying to focus on the value of what he had control over while he served. And that has seemed to help reframe it from being so overwhelming and so disappointing of what's actually happening today and refocusing his efforts on the goodness and the courage and the sacrifice that him and his fellow service members made while he was actually in Afghanistan. Sean, does that ring true to you? Is it about the, the, the feeling he has of whether it's worth it? Is there also that concern about those who were left behind? Absolutely. My, my husband has a lot of survivor's guilt to begin with. So I think that this, what has happened in Afghanistan has amplified that as well as he has a son that's in the army. So, you know, we sit here wondering if he's going to be over there or not fighting again, just like my husband did. So I think that's very, um, 
now his macho-ness probably, he, he doesn't bring that up a lot, um, uh, but I know that's there, that worry and concern of his son going back to where he was. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We began our Cross America journey tonight, St. Louis, Austin. Here in Nashville, from Washington, D.C., the side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> it was talking smack part of this. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin. Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. I want to ask all of you how you're doing, because we know that caregivers are truly on the front lines, and it's not easy to be in your position and be the ones who have to watch and be vigilant and worry and be on the receiving end of some of these really hard emotions. So, Betsy, how are you handling this? Well, I've been asked that several times, Savannah, but um, I've been kind of numb through this all because I'm in caregiver mode. I'm in survival mode because my husband is in, is in crisis mode dealing with this. So for me, I don't have time to think about how I'm doing. I have time to think about how he's doing. So in that i am okay um i am thankful for my caregiver friends like kern and sean and the elizabeth dole foundation for rallying around us and supporting us um but this is where we thrive to be honest as caregivers especially as dole foundation fellows and um we're in our element here so we're, we're good right now <laughs> at least i am um it's hard um, but we don't know any other way to support our husbands and our service members except for being the rock that they need us to be. Well, we know you are all good in a crisis. It's just unfortunate that you find yourselves having to, to call on that again. How are you doing, Sean? It's been tough. And I think it's an accumulation from this past year to begin with. Um, my husband has been inpatient four times in this past year, so I, I, I don't want to go there again. And, and when I look around, you know, home and what is going on, it, what really gets me is, is my 10 year old and how she is feeding off his anxiety and she's been around all that. So she knows what could possibly happen. And, and that hurts my heart more than anything. Um, school starting. So not only on top of, you know, the pandemic, now she's worried about dad and school starting. So there's, there's a lot of um, just making sure she's okay too. And as Betsy said, you know, we're all leaders in this space too. So we, we are really plugged in to our groups online and the caregivers and what they're going through. So, you know, not only are we in crisis mode at home and with our kids, but as well as trying to serve those caregivers that are in our space. And what's most important, just like Betsy said, if we don't have other caregivers around us, that's that's when our, our mental health is going to suffer. So I think bringing an awareness of you've got to reach out to other caregivers that are in this space, we've got to do that so that we can continue in crisis mode and caregiver mode. 
Corinne, what would your message be to other caregivers out there who are at home and may not even use that word, may not even recognize themselves as that, but know that they are in crisis? I think that um, for me, it's been an interesting experience, these kinds of events, but I'm actually, I'm isolating right now because I have COVID. And so I am, I feel like many caregivers who are away from their care recipients. I think of service members and veterans who are in inpatient, whose family members and caregivers cannot be by them in the hospital. I think of veterans who are in hospice care or in long-term care facilities who are also watching the news and experiencing this and not able to be direct support. For me, it's been a lot of FaceTime. It's been a lot of text messages. It's been a lot of phone calls and checking in. We've been meeting out in the backyard, uh, you know, and socially distancing and trying to check in with each other. And um, so I think that for caregivers who don't necessarily recognize their own roles yet, um, I hate to say, but this is a really good example of a period of self-reflection to say, do I find myself being more supportive to my veteran than I am to myself in this moment? Am I having to um, de-escalate? Am I having to talk through things? Am I having to try and distract away and monitor um, access to television and social media? Do I find myself having to do those things? And if the answer is yes, then I think the best thing that we can say is welcome. Welcome to our community. Welcome to being one of us. And you, you're not alone. There's a whole social and physical network out there of military and veteran caregivers who are doing this work every day. And there are resources in place. So when you stop fixing, come and hang out with us. I've heard that so many times over the years working with caregivers that when I say, what do you need or what helps? That, you know, there's all the kind of practical needs, but that the number one thing caregivers have always shared with me is just belonging to this community and not feeling alone and feeling like you have someone to talk to. Well, even when we got on the Zoom, Savannah, this morning, and I see Sean and Corinne, it just immediately brings my mood to a place where like, all right, I got this, right? We're, we're in this together. We're experiencing this together. We've come to this together and we're going to get through it supporting one another and together. Sean, what does this community mean to you? The world. Um, I would not be in a good mental health place without the caregivers that I know around me, that I know I can text, I can call, I can vent, um, I can say the good things and the bad things and there's no judgment. It's a safe place. And I know that they know that they can lean on me too. So with, without that, I don't think that this caregiving spot that I find myself in would be as fulfilling as it is without other caregivers and the Elizabeth Dole Foundation support behind us. I just cannot um, stress enough to reach out and make sure that you're in a space. You have to put yourself in a space where there's other caregivers and other support. And the Elizabeth Dole Foundation is right here waiting for those caregivers. And last thing, um, you know, I, 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 we haven't talked about the politics, whether it's right or wrong that we withdrew, whether it was handled well. We're setting all that aside for the purposes of this conversation, but what would you like to hear from our leaders, specifically to our veterans and, and to you, the caregivers who are helping them through this really difficult time? Betsy? Thank you for asking that question. Um, and I really think it is, how is our government going to support the veterans that did go to Afghanistan now as they are suffering? And um, it has to be more than a few social media posts and a few public appearances. Um, it really needs to be comprehensive behavioral health programming for our veterans so that when these crisis moments happen, they are prepared for it. And the onus isn't on us as the caregivers to get them through it. So I 
I would appreciate um, some kind of acknowledgement that they are suffering and they are committed to their mental health and their well-being. Corinne? For me, I would say that it's important to reaffirm with a genuine sense of compassion and understanding that our veterans matter, that their experiences matter, that their service matters. And, um, and so I think that in, in some of those statements, that, that has been lacking a little bit. And some of that is just the inability to understand unless you were there. And it's the same thing that we find ourselves in. Um, being a sympathetic ear and a support mechanism without a true, genuine, experiential understanding. And so for me, for my husband, that's the big question. And that's the one that he would, would like to feel has been answered, which is, you know, tell me that I mattered. Tell me that we all mattered. You know, look at a gold star family in the face and tell them it mattered. Sean, I'll let you have the final word. Well, I agree with both of them. I think our leaders need to stand up and make sure that they are stating that your time in Afghanistan mattered. And that is not only on a national level. We need to hear it in our communities as well. From the leaders in our communities, they need to understand that they have got to make a point to say, your time in service in Afghanistan mattered not only to the veteran, but to the family members and the caregivers, we see you too. We know what you are doing behind the scenes as your veterans are experiencing the range of emotions that they are going through. So it has to be that as these veterans are seeking out help, that we make sure that those professionals that they are going to also look past the veteran and look into the family and how that they can support in a holistic way the entire family because the entire family needs support right now. Well, I hope we are shining a light on all of you. You're my heroes. I wish I could wrap my arms around you, but thank you for your service because I think caregivers give service to our country every bit as our veterans. Um, so thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. The Today Show's newest fan. This is the Little Al Roker. What am I doing here? What am I doing here? These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. We began our Cross America journey tonight, St. Louis, Austin, here in Nashville, from Washington, D.C., the site of our nation's capital. You rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin. Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. There's kind of this this life to caregiving. Sometimes it feels like a constant game of, of curveballs. <laughs> we were in this alone and just trying to figure out everything and then him adjusting back to civilian life was 
just so challenging. There are sometimes I just didn't have answers. Kara Benson of Cocoa Beach, Florida, and Teresa Smith of Big Lake, Minnesota, live hundreds of miles apart, but are close at heart. Both women are caregivers for their veteran husbands. Kara's husband, Eric, was an Army combat engineer in Iraq. He sustained blast and chemical exposures and now suffers from a traumatic brain injury and degenerative neurological issues. He was injured in 2003, but to put it into perspective, we didn't receive even a partially firm diagnosis until 2018. There were so many years of, this is wrong, and, and doctors saying, well, you know, we don't know, it's, it's in your head. Cheese's husband, Jason, also suffers from a traumatic brain injury after being injured in an IED blast in Afghanistan in 2009. I remember pretty vividly um, just, just the hot embers falling and just the um, darkness turning into light, you know, and the feeling, the concussion. I shrugged it right off. I was back to work within a day. Their husbands returned from deployment changed men, while their wives tried to pick up the pieces, suffering in silence themselves as the stress of their new roles as caregivers took a toll. It was very isolating and very infuriating. And at that point in time, we didn't have a support network. We didn't have caregivers that I knew. Um, I was just learning the system to help him out. And so it was so infuriating and so lonely to fight that fight. But four years ago, that fight got a little less lonely with the creation of the Hidden Heroes campaign by the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, providing veteran caregivers with the help and recognition they so deserve. Hidden Heroes connects caregivers to helpful resources and each other. Hidden Heroes has given me a voice, a sense of belonging. For me, it's been life-changing. There is a camaraderie that comes in the darkest hours. <laughs> Really. And now both Teresa and Kara want to help light the way for other struggling caregivers. They have been selected to be Hidden Heroes Fellows, an honor for 225 caregivers around the country to serve as allies for other caregivers and give a voice to the voiceless. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It's not gonna be easy, you know. But that doesn't mean because you fail sometimes doesn't mean that, you know, you give up. Don't give up even if you have to take it minute by minute, step by step, even if you cannot see the finish line and know that you don't have to do it alone. We'll be there to help you along when you need it. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. Oh, no. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news for hours into the Iowa caucuses by the man who never did. All right, it just fit too. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. We began our Cross America journey tonight. St. Louis, Austin, here in Nashville, from Washington, D.C., the site of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin. Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And it is our pleasure to be joined now by Teresa and Jason Smith, Kara and Eric Benson, and four other Hidden Heroes fellows and their families. <laughs> we have the Poyer family, the Collins family, the Pabin family, and the Bristol family. And their heroes are here. And now you know the true story. The caregivers are heroes, mm. too. Kara, we just met you and heard a little bit about your story in the piece. What? How do you get up every day? Where do you fill your tank? Where do you find your... Um, your resources to go forward every day, even on the hard ones? 
I think getting the network has really helped me find the resources. Caregivers are a wealth of information, and the more you connect with each other, uh, the more we can share that information. And, and filling my tank is taking those five minutes out of the day, whether it be to connect with the caregivers, see how they're doing, um, connect with a friend, listen to music. Just that five-minute checkout does absolutely wonders when you are caregiving for a husband and multiple children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got your hands full. We say good morning to all the whole family there. A new day, a new pop star plus. Thanks for being here. Coming up on today's show, the woman behind the voice of Bart Simpson. She's sharing memories more than 30 years of The Simpsons. Plus, we're going to catch up with the legendary Goldie Hawn, and we're going to honor a music icon's birthday today, the one and only Dolly Parton. But first, check out today's pop star. We're going to start this morning, however, with Britney Spears. Her legal battle with her father is intensifying as she continues to speak out about her growing feud with her mother and her sister. Mm. Pop star correspondent Miguel Almaguer now joins us with the latest. Hey, Miguel. <laughs> Hey, Carson, good morning. Yes, Britney Spears has been much more outspoken since being released from her conservatorship, and now she is fighting with her family members in court and online. This morning, Britney Spears free, but still fighting. The pop star speaking out about her family as her legal battle with her father heats up. Jamie Spears had controlled many of his daughter's financial and personal dealings for almost 14 years and now asking that she pay his legal bills for the lengthy battle that ended the arrangement. Overnight, Brittany pushing back with legal documents saying Jamie enriched himself while acting as conservator with more than $6 million of the singer's earnings, also accusing her father of abusive and bullying conduct, chronic alcohol abuse and alleging an altercation between him and Britney's child. The documents allege that Jamie Spears used Britney's resources to further his own career, including an attempted cooking show and used a security firm to spy on her cell phone. Jamie Spears has previously stated that he acted to protect Britney as her conservator and unconditionally loves and supports his daughter. It comes as Britney is in a public war of words with her sister, Jamie Lynn Spears, who's promoting a new book. The younger sister saying in interviews that she tried to help Britney throughout the conservatorship. How many times can I take the steps without, um, you know, she has to walk through the door. On Tuesday, Brittany posting a new fiery Instagram post, now deleted, outlining a troubled family past, implying Jamie Lynn found fame through her older sister. Spears describing returning home after her breakup with Justin Timberlake, calling Timberlake's family all I knew for many years. Spears ending the post writing, I'm sorry, Jamie Lynn, I wasn't strong enough to do what should have been done. Slapped you and mama right across your expletive faces. Britney's legal team has filed a cease and desist request against her sister, trying to prevent her from referencing Britney's derogatory themes during her promotional campaign for the book. NBC News has reached out to Jamie and Jamie Lynn Spears and has not yet heard back. Carson. Well, Miguel, thanks. You're right. She got her freedom, but the fighting continues. We'll have more on that later. Uh, the Grammys is up next. After being postponed due to COVID-related concerns for the second year in a row, Music's Biggest Night has officially been rescheduled. The 64th Annual Grammys will now be held at the MGM Arena in Vegas on Sunday, April 3rd. Trevor Noah from The Daily Show still set to be your MC for the Grammys. There's, uh, there's a lot to look forward to. That's right. We've got your favorite, Uncle that's Al. Right, John Batiste. John Batiste is up for 11 awards this year. Uh, that's the most. Justin Bieber, Doja Cat, and a bunch of others. Her, we love around here mm -hmm. also. So we're looking forward to finally seeing who takes home the Grammys, this time in Vegas in the spring. Next up, Encanto. Is this on repeat in your house like it is on mine? Mm -hmm. The box office hit soundtrack has earned the highest charting song from an animated Disney movie in 26 years. Have you heard this one? We 
don't talk about Bruno that plays in my head constantly. <laughs> Performed by Carolina Guyton, uh, Muro Castillo, and the entire cast of Lin Manuel Miranda's latest musical masterpiece. Believe it or not, that track has actually surpassed Whoa. Let It Go from wow. Frozen yep. on the Billboard Hot 100. We don't talk about Bruno. Bruno, by the way, John Leguizamo, the voice of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, coming in at number four on this week's chart, thanks to 29 million <laughs> streams, 28 of those in the Daily Household, 8,000 downloads. The last song from an animated Disney movie to rank at number four was Vanessa Williams' Colors of the Wind. That goes back to Pocahontas. Oh, wow. So it looks like everybody actually is talking about Bruno. <laughs> yes. wow. Guys, that's all your right. pop star. And we have a few more items to get to. After all, it is Popstar Plus. We'll start with Daniel Radcliffe. The Harry Potter stars just landed his next big gig, and it's far from the wizarding world. Radcliffe is set to play set to play Weird Al Yankovic in the upcoming biopic about the comic's life. Uh, Weird Al, of course, co-wrote the upcoming project that's titled Weird, the Al Yankovic story. The movie's gonna explore the Grammy winner's life from childhood through his surprising rise to fame. In a statement, Weird Al Yankovic said, I'm absolutely thrilled that Daniel Radcliffe will be portraying me in the film. I have no doubt whatsoever that this is the role future generations will remember him for. That's funny. No release date announced yet, but Weird will stream exclusively on Roku. Production is scheduled to kick off next month. Finally, Dorothea Taylor, AKA the godmother of drumming. That's the nickname given to this grandmother who's gone viral for her cover of Blink-182's punk rock hit, What's My Age Again? Let's just say she gives Travis Barker, I think, a run for his money. You should see her, she's got tattoos all over. No, she doesn't. That video is almost 800,000 views on YouTube and Instagram. Rock on. I love that, man. That's awesome to see. Well, those are your headlines. When we come back, what are some of your favorite Simpson episodes of all time? Well, the actor who's provided the voice of Bart Simpson on The Simpsons for more than three decades is revealing hers. That's next. Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Popstar Plus. Nancy Cartwright is best known for her voice, giving life to the naughty and rebellious but lovable Bart on The Simpsons for more than 30 years. Well, now she's out with a new audio book where she reveals what it's like to be part of one of the most iconic shows of all time. I wrote this book back in 2000, and it came out, and I did a, an audio book, but 20-some years had gone by and a lot of things happen in that interim. And so I decided it was time to come out with a new book. So that's what I did. And the new book called, I'm Still a 10 Year Old Boy, has all kinds of things in it that I didn't have in the original book. It was really interesting revisiting the book because um, I just got to bring back so many memories of what it was like when I first started. And, you know, it's kind of cathartic in a way because we've come, or I should say I've come such a long way. You know, when I was cast as Bart, it was like, it was such a dream come true for me because I think everybody has a little bit of Bart Simpson in him or her, you know, in them. <laughs> it's true, we all have 
these personalities. We're we're a, we're such a, a such a conglomeration of so many personalities. I describe Bart Simpson as being a ten year old school hating underachiever and proud of it. That was the description that I read in the original audition when I went, and I was supposed to go in for Lisa. But I decided I wanted to do Bart, and he just seemed more interesting than an eight-year-old middle child. His description was so much more clear. So I went in, and Matt Groening was there, and I had an idea in mind, and I said, blah, 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 blah. He's like, oh my God, that's him, that's Bart. And I was hired, boom, on the spot. <laughs> Eat my shorts. Eat my shorts. I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? I think Bart Simpson has probably got the most catchphrases of anyone. It's, I'm Bart Simpson, who the hell are you? Eat my shorts, get bent, no way man. Cowabunga, whoa mama. I mean, all these things are like, whoa. <laughs> Score. It's such a hard question to answer about like, what's my favorite, I don't really, it's kind of like asking who's your favorite kid. There's a good handful of episodes that definitely rank up there. Some of my favorites are the musicals. I love the musicals, like Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, you know, that's a really good one. Cause that's that takeoff on Mary Poppins and Sherry Bobbins is so funny and the singing of it is just crazy. You know, if you want to be our sitter, please be sweet and never bitter. If you wish to be our sitter, please be sweet and never bitter. Help us with math and book reports. Might I add, eat my shorts, Bart. Oh, when Bart gets an F, that's the title of it. It's the first show of the second season. And kind of humbly speaking, I guess, modestly speaking, that one, it got a lot of attention. And it takes Bart it turns him into, from the first 13 that we did the first season, that episode really shows you a level of Bart Simpson that you had never seen before. And he goes into, he just gets really, really sad. And he's super sincere about how he tried to study. And he starts to cry because he feels like he's gonna flunk the fourth grade. And um, that, that stands out in my mind. <laughs> What's the matter? Well, I would think you'd be used to failing by now. <laughs> no, you don't understand. I really tried this time. I mean, I really tried. Early on in the show, um, it was made very clear to us that, that the actors are not the stars of the show, that the characters are the stars of the show, and I, I, nobody had any problem with that. I don't think anybody had any idea that the show was going to go on, you know, 33 plus years and, and turn into the icon that it is. But we instead were all like armpit to armpit, elbow to elbow in one little tiny booth that was not meant for recording in. So we had like moving carpets up on the walls because they were one big wall was all glass. And when we spoke, it would vibrate. So they had to put a carpet in front of it and we would all share the same microphone, armpit check, you know. Uh, um, and here I am very pregnant. It was a lot of um, give and take from, from all of us actors. But it was, I, I look at that and like, that is such a, such a humble, modest beginning for what came to be, you know. It's pretty cool. When I meet fans, it's like, it's, it's pretty cool because most of the time I'm not recognized. Most of the time I'm just this anonymous celebrity and it doesn't matter where I am, nobody, because I don't look like him, my skin's not yellow, nine spikes, I'm not a 10 year old boy. But I can have more causation over revealing who I really am. And so if it's just a spontaneous thing and I'm talking to somebody and I ask them, so what's your name? And they say, oh, my name's Katie and I'll say, oh, Hi, Katie, I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? And it is just like the jaw drops to the ground. And it, it's equally fun for me. It still is to this day. I love surprising people. And it's kind of a cool thing. It sometimes pops people out of their funk. And isn't that kind of what we need right now? We need some kind of enlightenment. We need some humor, some lightness, some aesthetics. One question that people like to ask me is, 
why is The Simpsons so successful? How has it lasted this, this long? And I think it just, it, it actually doesn't even matter what, this is funny to say this, what decade you look at, because we're, <laughs> we're in our third decade, that's crazy. But no matter what decade you look at, The Simpsons has a consistency in the, the business model, in you know, the way that it's done. It's got this family that has its own kind of rules or, or lack, of, lack of rules. And, they're kind of a nice, quote unquote, normal family. And I do think they represent a lot of people that can say, wow, that's us. You know, whether it's the Simpsons or all the citizens of Springfield, it's like people can find things that they can relate to. And that has been such a success and the tip of the hat to the writers and the executives on the show. And we should mention Nancy's audiobook, I'm Still a 10 Year Old Boy, is available on Audible. Just ahead on Popstar Plus, a visit with the glorious Goldie Hawn. We began our Cross America journey tonight. St. Louis, Austin. Here in Nashville. From Washington, D.C. The side of our nation's capital. You rarely see. This your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the man, the never All right, it just made it We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year gonna look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back. Goldie Hawn is an absolute legend in Hollywood with an Oscar and all kinds of hit movies under her belt. She's also the driving force behind a cool program that focuses on the mental well-being of kids. And Goldie, who's very passionate about the project, told us all about it. Our next guest is an actress, producer, director, philanthropist, mother, grandmother, and the list goes on, but we're running out of time. So we're talking about the one and only Goldie Hawn. Just add legend to it. She starred as Helen Sharp in the hilarious dark comedy Death Becomes Her. She kept us in stitches in the beloved movie Overboard, both films celebrating milestone anniversaries this year. Actually. But Goldie's most recent role is one that's very close to her heart, and that is mental health advocate. She launched Mind Up for Life back in 2003, a program that teaches children skills that they can use to regulate stress and other emotions. Well, it has recently gone digital, and Goldie joins us now to tell us all about it. Hi, Goldie. Good Hi, morning. Goldie. Good morning, everybody. I'm still got frogs in my throat. It's so early here anyway. <laughs> I know you're nice to wake up so early on the West Coast, but I know it's because this cause is so dear to you. You've been at this for a long time, and this is, uh, explain to people yeah. what this project is, because it's not mental health counseling. This is really education about mental health. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do I do think that if we're going to teach children, uh, and this was in 2003 that I started this, uh, we should teach children, let them understand how their brain works. Uh, so Mind Up is really neuroscience based, and it's there so our children can actually understand their brain, how it works, how to access it, and also how to regulate their emotions. Because once they understand how their brains work, then they can access a way to control it. So managing your brain and understanding it, 
is vitally important for our children's well-being and also for their mental health. And you know, when I created this program and but basically produced it and pulled neuroscientists together and positive psychologists and so forth and put everything into one program, which basically goes into the classroom. And that program actually helps them learn and feel better and understand these tools of how to manage their stress. I mean, it's so simple, mm. and yet it should be put in every classroom. And, and so that's what we're launching today. Mm -hmm. And it's the first digital learning platform that we have had. And now we have 27 countries coming. We're working with parents again. We're working with families as well as in the school. Yeah. So teachers can take the program and um, put it into their, in their classroom. And this is needed, very, obviously, very Goldie, it's needed now, as you know, more than ever with the pandemic and isolation. But, you know, you started this program back in 2003. You've had your own mental health journey yeah. began when you were 19 years old. How have you noticed how society is talking about mental health then versus now? It's a big difference. People now are really recognizing that our brain is a muscle and it actually can be affected and offended in many ways and enlightened, of course, um, by our surroundings. And it's, it's especially being shown with our children right now. It's, it's an epidemic, guys. We're, we're really in trouble. Our children need us. They need uh, programs that should be in schools, every school in America, every school in the world. You know, America is not the only one who's suffering from children's mental destabilization. And so we have to be here as the adults that are saying, look, we have to change. If we don't give them this in their classroom to deal with mental stability, mental health, and how they get over problems and critical thinking and mm -hmm. things we need, we are not going to have the world that we would like tomorrow. So our children are our biggest resource. And how have you used this knowledge? Because as I mentioned, it's really, it's, you, you said it was neuroscience. You're learning about the amygdala and the hippocampus, all those things I was supposed to memorize in science exactly. class and never did. But <laughs> how does that, having that knowledge about the brain's anatomy help you deal with, you know, mental health challenges? That's a good question. And because you know the aspect of the brain, they understand the midbrain. And even when they're little, the amygdala is, and we use some little animals, right? So when we lose the, you know, use the barking dog. And they understand that the prefrontal cortex can't think when the amygdala is active, overactive. So what they do is they breathe, they focus. All these things have direct correlation to neurological activity. So when you give the brain what it needs, in order to focus better, mm -hmm. to learn better, to absorb better, then they're oh able to take the information. So we have to give them context yeah. into their brain so they can actually manage it. And even just, you know, kind of you know, simpler than that, I mean, for me, when I was diagnosed with general, generalized anxiety disorder, going to the doctor, I opted for cognitive therapy. You know, just cognitive thinking really helps because it does teach you, if you don't know the parts of the brain, it teaches you that brain causes behavior. And once you have that understanding of that model, you don't think you're broken. And that's a big part of this whole mental health exactly. challenge. It was for me anyway. Exactly. exactly. And it worked for me. I mean, I was very anxious when I became successful. I didn't know what I was, what was happening. You know, I was 19 years old and I went to a doctor and then I learned about meditation and then I learned about how to self-regulate myself and find a more positive way of approaching things. Mm. And, and I was a positive person anyway. So it was really, I came, came back to myself. So I think that we have to know that it's not a bad word to say I'm mentally disturbed right now. I don't feel good. It's okay. It's that we have ways of, of and tools to be able to help, especially our children. You know, once they do mind up, it's like riding a bike. They yep. never forget it. And we've done this in some of our longitudinal studies. Wow. So I just I'm advocating for mind up or online mindup.com. Yep go there i mean dot org sorry and 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 sign up really for the teachers to go in the classroom i mean we've got seven million children already uh, up in an approximation we can't everything because people have taken mind up on their own yeah in the world so let's let's keep going we're gonna do let's it, get it in we're gonna get them there the website's gonna go get flooded today See, you, that's I, what got her up at four o'clock right. in the morning well, you've produced a lot of great movies but produce this might be your best production yet goldie thank, thank you so you, much goldie. Well, Great. Thanks, sweetheart. You Thanks got it. So We're going to talk more, of course, in the third and fourth hour. We want to mention that you can find more about Mind Up for Life at today.com.
It's always a little bit bright. You know what? It's a lot brighter when Goldie Hawn is around. Thanks, Goldie. Still to come, another beloved icon. We're going to head into the Today Vault as we mark Dolly Parton's birthday. You're not going to want to miss it. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with... Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just love that. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. And we're back on Popstar Plus with a little something from The Vault. The delightful and talented American icon that is Dolly Parton turned 76 today. And in her honor... Here she is speaking about her beloved film back in 1989, Steel Magnolias, right here on Today. Truvy, uh, did she ring true to you? You are a, a, a native daughter of the South. Yeah, it's totally related to her. She's not different from me at all. I mean, it wasn't hard for me to play a, a Southern girl with a Southern accent, and it's not foreign to me, like you said in your little intro for me to do hair because I grew up doing my sister's hair, my friend's hair. I started cutting and bleaching and a sawing on my own hair when I was about <laughs> 15 years old. And I love it. And I think probably had I not been fortunate uh, and made it in the business, which is what I wanted to do, I probably would have been a beautician and probably been a good one. Oh, you would have been fun. I'd have done a lot of bouffants and beehives, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> Truvy, what kind of a name? Truvy, what, is that a nickname for something else I don't recognize? I don't know. That was Bobby Harling's name, the, the yeah. guy that wrote the, the play. But it's a good name. It sounds very to me, very real. And what about the other ones? We've set Truvy, Anel, Sally Field plays Malin, Olympia Dukakis is Clary, Shirley MacLaine is Weezer, <laughs> Sam Shepard is your husband, he's Spud. Yeah. Are these real names? Well, don't. Uh, there's a lot of names. There are a lot of names like that in the South. So I think all those names sound just fine for this particular script. They all seem to fit the characters. Now, if you were growing up with the, your sisters and doing their hair, you probably didn't hang out at the local beauty spot. But that um, the the beauty parlor culture, where where gossip is is the uh, the pastime. I mean, my gracious, is that real? Oh, of course. I think anytime you get a bunch of women doing anything uh, in, a, in a room, they talk about everybody. Uh, I even wrote a song for the movie that didn't make the movie. It was called Tattle Tales, and it says something about in the, in the beauty shop, every story is a pearl, and you don't have to roll it to get your hair curled. It's not like everybody's <laughs> always talking about it, but I think women love to gossip, love to... You know, you got to watch yourself. Nobody's safe when they walk out the door. I can. You obviously like women, though. I mean, you've done a, a first picture with uh, Lily Tomlin and Jane Fonda. It would strike me that that uh, someone who was the new girl in town in terms of your new role as an actress, you have not hesitated to work with real heavies in motion pictures. How come you weren't shyer? Well, I feel very confident in who I am as a personality, and I've always been real sure of, of what I do in my world, and I assume when they ask me to do these parts that they think that I can handle it, and I think that I can too. I'm not a great actress, but I'm not intimidated by these people. I feel just fortunate to get the opportunity to work around them, and I learn something from all the people I've worked with, and what? I do work well with women because I, I love my sisters and my aunts, and I have a lot of great friends. So Why do you say you're not a great actress. Well, because I'm not. I mean, I never studied it. I mean, if I, uh, my acting is, is pretty much like, I think it's easier for me because I'm a singer and I, I do a lot of dramatic things in, in song and there's a lot of drama, I think, in, in emotional songs. So I think that it was easier for me than it would be just somebody just walking in that had never acted that was, you know, doing something else. Yeah, but even so, it looked like acting 
to my eye. Does the director deal with you differently? I mean, do, if you don't know the code words and the language and so forth of actresses, does he talk to you in different ways than he does maybe a, a, a Sally Field or Shirley MacLaine who have always been actresses? That's a good question, and yes, they have to because I don't know anything. I, even after all the movies I've done now, three, three movies, three or four movies, I still don't know like where the light is and where I'm supposed to stand and certain marks and certain terms, like you said. So I have to totally depend on the director to do that. It doesn't bother me because I feel like that's their job and they know that I'm not a, a skilled actress or anything and I don't know all those terms. So you get a good director, uh, that's what they're supposed to do and Herbert Ross did a real good job. He had a little trouble with me because I didn't, I wasn't a real actress and he's so used to working with real skilled people so he's pretty hard on me at times but it was all for the best. I think he got good, uh, a good performance out of me every time that he was very hard on me. Happy birthday, Dolly. That's all we have for today on Popstar Plus. Be sure and join us again tomorrow as we catch up with one of the stars of the new show, How I Met Your Father. Be well, everybody. We'll see you soon. Hey, there you are. Hello to all of you watching our favorite streaming channel today all day. And look at us. Reunited and it feels so good. We are really happy to be reunited for this episode of Today in 30. And for you at home, it's a packed show. Not just our singing, but also <laughs> real news. Once again, let's get to our top story. We're talking about safety concerns surrounding 5G wireless technology, which did arrive overnight. Some flights already canceled despite the launch being delayed near some airports. So the question is, what does it mean for airlines and passengers? Well, Tom Costello will have the latest there. And then, do you remember the movie Cool Runnings? Who could forget? For the first time in over two decades, the beloved four-man Jamaican bobsled team is heading to the Winter Olympics. And we got to catch up with two of its stars to help them celebrate. And one of Hollywood's biggest and brightest stars, Goldie Hawn, joins us. She's working very hard on a very special project that's important to her and she can't wait to share it with you. And if you've got kids or grandkids, you're going to want to hear all about that. Absolutely. So without further ado, let's get this show on the road. It's time for Today, Today in 30. 30. NBC's Tom Costello is on the story. He joins us from Reagan National this morning. Hi, Tom. Morning. Yes, yeah, Savannah, good morning. So, you know, we have seen these two industries really at each other for months now. The aviation industry and the cell phone industry. The aviation industry concerned that 5G could interfere with critical cockpit technology. The cell phone industry saying that concern is completely overblown. 5G has proven to be safe in countries all over the world. But now the cell phone industry has blinked. 5G not going live at most airports around the country. Fifth generation or 5G cell service is officially here this morning for millions of Americans with AT&T and Verizon launching their ultra high speed networks overnight after reaching a last minute deal with the nation's airline industry. Both companies say they'll temporarily limit or delay their 5G towers that are located near some airports. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And I think uh, I, I think as we work together, we'll get we'll get to the right place. For months, the airline industry and aviation experts have warned of massive disruptions to travelers and the supply chain. At issue, the frequency used by Verizon and AT&T's 5G networks and the potential it could interfere with a plane's altimeter. So concerning, the FAA actually told pilots not to rely on altimeters at more than 80 airports near 5G sites. 50, 40, 30. Altimeters bounce a signal off the ground to let pilots know their precise distance to the ground. Critical for landing and essential when doing so in bad weather. Certainly uh, minimizing flight disruptions, uh, ensuring uh, safety in travel is a, is a top priority. On Tuesday, the White House thanked the cell phone companies for their cooperation, with President Biden calling the expansion of 5G a priority and a massive step in the right direction. But the agreement follows years of political infighting involving the FCC, the FAA, cell phone companies, airlines, and two presidential administrations, all with competing agendas. Both Verizon and AT&T, which say they acted voluntarily, blame the FAA for not resolving the issue ahead of their launches. AT&T, in a statement writing, we are frustrated by the FAA's inability to do what nearly 40 countries have done, which is to safely deploy 5G technology without disrupting aviation services. Are you relieved? Relieved is a word. It's unnecessary. This deadline was commercially driven. I understand why the cell phone companies be upset. They spent billions of dollars, but you know what? That's not my problem. 
So, Tom, 5G was paused around some of the airports, but there are still some foreign airlines that are canceling flights. So why is that? Yeah, some international carriers are still concerned about 5G, specifically with the Boeing 777. Uh, and 5G is still live, of course, over most of the country. And the concern is any impact as they fly over those cities into airports, Hoda. The fashion world has lost an influential trailblazer who had the power to push new trends and break old rules. Former Vogue creative director and editor at large, Andre Leon Talley, died yesterday. A man widely considered to be a creative force and an unforgettable presence. Standing six feet, six inches tall, Andre Leon Talley was a towering presence, both literally and figuratively, in the world of fashion. With his flowing robes and colorful captains, Talley was a fixture on glamorous red carpet events and for years was seated front and center at high profile runway shows around the globe. Overnight, Tally's Instagram account announced the passing of the 73-year-old fashion icon, saying in part, Mr. Tally was the larger-than-life, longtime creative director at Vogue during its rise to dominance as the world's fashion bible. It was at Vogue that Tally made his mark alongside Anna Wintour. In 1988, he became the publication's first African-American creative director and was ultimately named editor at large. In his book, The Chiffon Trenches, Tally wrote of his influential position at Vogue. Anna Wintour may be the highest ranking black man in the history of fashion journalism. Tally was outspoken about the lack of diversity in the fashion industry and became a trailblazer using his influence to feature black models on Vogue's cover and showcasing black designers in the magazine. Raised by his grandmother in the Jim Crow South and reaching the highest ranks of the fashion world was no easy task, as he told Al on Today. Every day is a struggle for a black man, no matter what station in life you've achieved. I could have been George Floyd. I could have been Ahmed Arbery. Really nothing has changed. So my story is a story of how to survive all odds, no matter what the odds are. His artistic vision later extending beyond publishing, serving as a stylist for the Obamas during Barack Obama's presidency. This is the Andre Leon Talley. And later holding court as a judge on America's Next Top Model. Andre Leon Talley, the death of a beloved fashion giant at the age of 73. You know, Andre touched the hearts of so many. We were just talking about it. I woke up this morning, I checked social media, and it seems like almost everything, mm -hmm. everybody I know, you know, mm -hmm. he just touched so many lives. Yeah, you know. it's a real trailblazer. Yeah, absolutely. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. This is your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. We are back at 739 with our countdown to the Winter Olympics. The action begins in just 15 wow. days. Can't believe it. And this morning, we can tell you that for the first time in more than two decades, Jamaica will be competing in the four-man bobsled. All right, we're going to talk to two members of that team in just a moment. But first, NBC's Carrie Sanders has more on the determined athletes who didn't let pesky warm weather get in the way of their dreams. <laughs> hey, Carrie. 
Good morning, guys. You know, the Winter Olympics for us is all about Team USA, but there is an island nation about an hour and 20 minutes from here, known for its beaches and palm trees like we have right here in Miami, that captured our hearts before and may again capture our hearts as they're heading to, yes, the Winter Olympics. And across the island nation, there's one refrain this morning, Yaman. Feel the rhythm, feel the ride, get on up, it's bobsled time. Jamaica's first Olympic bobsled team in 1988 inspired a movie. Go to Olympics, fight for Jamaica. Cool Runnings captured the start of Jamaican bobsled, and this year, a new group of athletes is hoping to carry on that legacy. For the first time in more than two decades, a four-man bobsled team from Jamaica has qualified for the Olympics. Go to the Olympics. When the Jamaican bobsled team made its Olympic debut at the Calgary Winter Games, they had a brutal crash. But their walk to the finish line charmed the world. Chris Stokes was part of that original team. If John Candy were still with us as coach, what would he tell these guys? <laughs> you know, a gold medal is a wonderful thing, but if you're not good enough without it, you're not good enough with it. The tropical country's warm weather climate does not make training for winter sports easy. Pilot Shan Wayne Stevens, who serves in the UK Royal Air Force, once got a laugh from the Queen herself talking about his methods. So how do you train? Uh, so uh, during the lockdown, unfortunately, with all the gyms and everything closed, oh, yeah. we had to sort of resort to unorthodox sort of training methods. So I've been uh, pushing a car up and down the street. I've had to make a gym. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose that's one way to train. In Beijing, Team Jamaica will make even more history, qualifying in the two-man bobsled and the new women's monobob event. And for the first time, Jamaica will have an Olympic alpine skier. Three million people on this little dot in the Caribbean. And to see what we are doing, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Might there be a sequel to the movie? Who knows, but let's just hope in competition there are no sequel crashes. Right, guys? All right, Carrie, thank you. We're so happy to welcome in two members of the 2022 Jamaican bobsled Olympic team, the pilot, Sean Wayne Stevens, and brakeman, Nimroy Target. Guys, good morning. N congratulations. I love the flag waving. Nimroy, <laughs> this is your first Olympic game, so tell us how it feels. Well, um, I am absolutely buzzing. Um, I am happy. I am proud of myself and my teammate and what we have accomplished. And we are prepared to go to the Olympics to put on a great show. Sean Wayne, you guys have worked so yeah. hard. You're the pilot for the team. You've got the two man, the four man, and you guys have really been a force. So, you know, this isn't a surprise, at least not to you, right? Uh, no, absolutely not. We've put in a lot of hard work the last four years to achieve what we've achieved. And like uh, it said in the, in the VT, um, over the lockdown, we've even come up with our own ways of getting the training done because we didn't want to leave any stone on turn uh, when it came to qualifying for the game. So we can now look back and say, look, we did absolutely everything that we could have done to achieve our goal and, and we've achieved it. Well, we loved how you were talking to the queen and you told her about <laughs> pushing that car and you got a giggle out of her. What was that moment like for you? No, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> just to be able to, to tell the, the queen about uh, our sport and, and, and how we train and stuff like that and for her to actually uh, react the way she reacted, uh, it, was, it, it was an awesome feeling. Well, Nimroy, you know, when you're on the Jamaican bobsled team, you don't just have Jamaica rooting for you. Yeah. You really have the whole world rooting for you. What does it mean to the country and to, to the Olympic effort? Um, definitely, it, it means a lot to Jamaica, knowing that we are a tropical country uh, with no snow, no <laughs> um, proper training facility to train for um, winter sport. And uh, what we have accomplished, it, it's really amazing. Well, you know, uh, a lot of people are familiar with the movie Cool Runnings, and we know it's based on that true story. Did you guys get a chance to talk to the other four-man bobsled team? Do they have any advice for you? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, the 
original driver uh, Dudley Stokes um, he used to be my, my driver coach um, unfortunately he's not uh, a part of the program anymore but he used to be uh, our driver coach and we had uh, countless hours where he was tell us stories of how they used to race and, 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 and stuff like that back in the day so uh, he's passed on a lot of knowledge on to me and then uh, hopefully I can pass on some of my knowledge that I've learned myself to the, the next generation of Jamaica Bob State pilots and, and athletes as well. Well, you're part of a great legacy. Yeah. We're so proud of you. Happy for you. All your hard work. Thank you for being with us this morning. Congrats, guys. Thank you very much. That smile. <laughs> Go Jamaica. Yeah. I love it. Wow. So good. Up. By the way, join us again tomorrow. We're going to mark two weeks oh. to go until the Winter Olympics. 16-year-old figure skater Alyssa Liu and hockey star Hillary Knight will be our live guest. Plus, we've got a first look at Team USA's opening ceremony outfits. Love I always to see like the to outfits. see that. Well, let's see what those are going to be like. And a reminder, you can catch the games. Of course, they start February 3rd right here on NBC, streaming on Peacock. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just is. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, you know, right? There is some late breaking news for hours to the Iowa caucuses. By the man with the Richard. All right, it just did so. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon, and by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it, I know that it can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at five on NBC News Now. We began our Cross America journey tonight, St. Louis, Austin, here in Nashville, from Washington, D.C., the side of our nation's capital you rarely see. It's your last one. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? We are back to, with Today Food, and this morning we are rolling out the red carpet for my fiancé is obsessed. <laughs> the, pa the pasta queen. Nadia Katerina Munoz family started a pasta factory, get this, back in the 1800s. Wow. Well, today she is carrying on the cooking tradition on TikTok. How cool is that from the 1800s and now this is the new way, TikTok, yeah. right? And Nadia combines cooking with the drama of telenovelas. That's fun. And her videos have more than 34 million likes. Let's give you a little taste. Got some fettuccine and lemons. Let's put them together. Ingredients. Melt half a stick of butter with the zest and juice of a lemon. One cup of heavy cream and salt it. And now cook for a few minutes and turn it off. Add the fettuccine, sprinkle some parmigiano and a little pasta water. Mix with the passion of an Italian. Just gorgeous. <laughs> oh my wow. goodness, I want to eat right now. Good morning, she joins us now, the Pasta Queen. How are you, Nadia? Hi, all. I'm so Great. happy you're with us this morning. Buongiorno. So let's get right to it so we have enough time here. <laughs> you're making two recipes, okay? So we're starting off with your cacao y pepe. I hope I'm saying that right. What ingredient is your secret to make this dish special? So it's cashew pepe's cheese and pepper pasta. You have to use a young pecorino romano, not aged too long, and then pasta water and freshly ground peppercorn. So let's get right into it. Okay, great. First of all, first of all look gorgeous. Oh, oh yeah. that's, <laughs> that's what you need for It's pasta. so funny, most of the time we do that off camera. I love how yeah. you like. <laughs> and the first step well, I could actually well, handle, <laughs> but then you have to actually boil water. So what's your tip yeah. on how much to put on the stove? 
Okay, so you have to use less water for this pasta because you want the spaghetti to be really starchy mm. and the pasta water to be super starchy. So you use half the amount you will usually use to do the pasta. Okay. And first thing we do is toast the pepper ground. So you have them on, I'm gonna splash a little bit of pasta water and that's gonna be the base foundation for this rich dish. Okay. And then doing straight the uh, pecorino romano, ground black peppercorns, pasta water, which is so starchy, which I, um, I'm going to whisk in, and we're going to create a perfect cream base mm. for the cacio e pepe. This recipe is so underrated. Mm. Two ingredients, and it's one of the classics. That's it? Growth. That's it? I bet you that's all. Yeah, that's TikTok, it. you get like a minute to tell the whole thing, so I she's able it. to do a recipe. Well, no, because wait, well, we, yeah. have, well, we have another recipe, but before, so you really just mix that and that's it that's for the it. first one? That's it, that's it. So what we're doing right now is putting the spaghetti al right. dente. It's, it's we're going sauce. to put them straight in the pan where we have the toasted pepper. Yeah. And mm. we're going to add the cream, you see? Mm. Oh. It's easy. So, so cool. Let's squeeze in that next one. Flame. Yeah, let's get to that. On a low Let's jump to the next one so we have time because that looks delicious. The lemon and ricotta. So Ooh. how do we get started with this? Okay, so super simple. Okay. So you've got the uh, pasta. This is like a totally uncooked sauce. Mm -hmm. So you have the pasta al dente that goes straight into the bowl. Okay. And you're going to have ricotta. And we're going to put it right in. Fresh okay. ricotta. Ooh. Then you're going to have a little bit of lemon juice. I like how easy these are. A little bit of yeah. lemon peels. Lemon peels. So the then heat of the pasta melts into... the ricotta. What was that? Yeah. And parmesan. now I'm gonna put that was that was pecorino cheese. Oh pecorino. So ricotta, pecorino cheese, lemon juice, mm -hmm. lemon pecorino. peel, a little bit of pasta water, and then all you do is mix it in, mm. and the sauce just cook, cook straight with the pasta. So you're using the heat of the pasta so to smart. cook this pasta dish. Brilliant. That looks so and good it, and easy. And it, uh, and we could actually do it. Thank you, Nadia, so much. It was so nice to meet you. You actually you did something that we can all do. That's right. Long live the queen. Yes. Oh, Thank God. you, Nadia. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Pepe. Arrivederci. Yes. <laughs> She's fun. I love it. And for these recipes and oh, so much more, you can head to our website at today.com slash food. That was totally doable. All yeah. Right. We'll be right back. People really don't know what's going to happen. Really a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news for hours since the Iowa caucuses. All right, it just me too. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. These days, the news never stops. The morning's headlines change by afternoon. And by the end of the day, it's all totally different. So let's get into it what's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. I get it. I know that it can be hard to keep up. So let's get started together and go from there. Hey, I'm Hallie Jackson, and we have a ton going on tonight. Here's the deal. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. A 19 years old Goldie Hawn moved to LA to become a dancer, but she became a Hollywood superstar instead. And you know what? She's effervescent, man. It's her happy spirit on and off the camera that she is most famous for. That's so true. And she's back with us this morning to tell us about something she's passionate about 
her incredible foundation. Yeah. Goldie. Goldie. We can't wait to talk to you about your foundation. I, we talked to you on the 8, and I loved it. I loved it on the 9, and we want to talk about it here, too. But before we get to it, we just had – Jen and I had a little chat about – first dates and how Mariska Hargitay said she met the love of her life on the set of Law and & Order and he just like walked right in and swept her off her feet. And we were talking about mm. cool couples we love. And we saw that you're in Kurt's first date was dancing at a Playboy club. I was like, that is an awesome first date. Is that right? We did that and we went out because we had to learn to dance for the show. Uh, under the let's go learn to do the jitterbug together. Uh, and uh, yes, it was kind of romantic. The, the whole night was romantic. Um, <clears throat> so that that's uh, that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Goldie, how but are you? How are you? It's so you. good to see love you. you. We love you. We love you. Great. You know, Goldie, you're we said earlier there is an effervescence yeah. about you. And and I read where you said, you know, yes, you have a happy gene. Like you just want yeah. to be happy. But there have been moments in your life where you haven't filled, you know, been filled with joy. Mm -hmm. And what what have those been like for you? How did you get back to, to you, to your essence? Okay, I'm gonna be real straight. Um, I'm gonna talk about mind up. Okay. And the reason is, and it was a really great segment, Jenna, because happiness is really important. I chose it when I was 11. And in 2003, four after, uh, you know, our 9-11 happened, I noticed that a lot of children were just not happy. Mm. They were committing suicide. We had an uptick of anxiety and depression. And our kids then were really in trouble. Mm -hmm. So being happy was really important. I wanted them to have a happy child. And it was disturbing to think that this is what was going on with our children today. Mm -hmm. So I started a program. I created a program called Mind Up. And that program was there so children understand their brain and how their brains work. And when the brain actually works properly and they understand it, they have context to their emotion. So we're giving them a way to self-regulate their emotions, understand how to do this, giving them three times a day a brain break mm -hmm. where they know every brain needs a break. And they really are much more capable of training their brain in a different way. Today, more than ever, we need it. And we're just launching today our program, which is why I'm here and I'm so excited well, because I've been doing this 20 years. And finally, we have it online. It's a digital learning program. We literally have 27 countries now involved, including our own. And by God, we are going to not turn a blind eye to our kids yeah. anymore. Put this in our schools and keep it going so we have healthier society tomorrow. Well, you know what's funny? You've been talking about this for a while. I was at an education summit, and you spoke about this, and your heart was out of your chest when you were discussing it. <laughs> you, and I have to tell you, parents used to, in the day, sit, tell, tell their kids, put on a happy yeah, face. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Don't fine. worry. Move on. Never getting to the actual issue. Exactly. It is, is absolutely extraordinary how we don't want to know that our children are suffering. And they don't know how to tell you. Mm -hmm. You know, they act out or they close themselves in their room or they get depressed. And honey, look what's happening today. 51% since 2019, mm. it's not that long ago, mm -hmm. have, have an uptick now of suicide, of ideation, of anxiety. 51% and 4%, only 4% are boys. The rest them are girls. Wow. So there's a lot of work to do. We have to figure this out because, you know, the world doesn't fix itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We fix the world, mm -hmm. so, you know, and we have to be equipped to do so. Yeah. And so you, happiness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Self-regulation. Yes. Mm -hmm. The ability to actually listen. Yes. Mm -hmm. And to solve problems together. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do that in the classroom. And by God, we're going to take that out into the world. And yeah. that's how and I And this feel. new digital yeah. platform. Yeah, we love the digital. How can people find it, Goldie? Thank you. It's mindup.org. Go on. It's for teachers. And they teach. They learn it. They get their certificate. They become a partner of ours and part of our family. And they take it into their schools. Mm -hmm. So it goes into schools all over the world all over it's, the world wow. and it's, it's really exciting and by the way this has been going on for 20 yes. years so we've already trained probably 7 million children globally but now we any child anywhere any teacher mm. any school mm. any parent can literally learn and actually take it in any part of the world we have 
translations mm -hmm. going on, and it's 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 really about how we bring the world together, yeah. uh -huh. being mindful and having right. brain well, fitness. The work Goldie. that you're doing is so thank so you, important. Goldie. Thank you. We thank love you. you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I love you too. We love Nick. you. <laughs> Honey, that is delicious coffee. Hey, just for you for today. <laughs> Hope you're with us for another big morning tomorrow on Today. Vice President Kamala Harris will join us. Plus, we'll be sitting down with Bob Saget's wife, Kelly Rizzo, as she opens up to honor her late husband. We'll see you then. I love the city of Baltimore. I've been coming here for years. And if there's one thing I know, the city of Baltimore is serious about his crap. I love Baltimore crabs. This is the, the, the stomp and vine of crabs. And I've been eating crabs since the time I could sit up at a table. It's a little spicy, salty and savory all in one. If I could describe the taste, you can. You just have to try it. <laughs> you just have to try it. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. When you think Maryland, you gotta think blue crab, an essential part of the state's culture and cuisine. And no place knows how to cook it up quite like Baltimore. I mean, just as many ways as you can count, you can find ways to eat crab. Of course, there's your basic, your, your steamed crab with the beautiful spices and you just start whacking that bad boy and you can get all that beautiful meat out. You can get cra canned crab if you'd like. Uh, of course, there's also the fabulous crab mac and cheese with a hot dog. There's the crab dip, there's your crab soup, and of course, the king of crab, the crab cake. Yes, but this is a cake that needs no icing. Crab cakes have been enjoyed by many for centuries throughout the Chesapeake region. But here in Baltimore, they're a way of life. And one of the city's most popular go-tos is tucked away just inside the world-famous Lexington Market. We're headed back to Houston today and we wanted to have the best crab cake in town. We're from Orlando, glad to be here. People have been coming to Fabies for years. Yes. Ever since I was little and I'm um, 25. <laughs> People from all around the world come here to Baltimore just to grab a bite of the famous Fadley's Crab Cake. It's made with fresh Maryland crab and family love. Everybody looks the same. How are you, my dear? Hello. Hello, hello. So good to see you. <laughs> How are you, sir? You looking good? You're looking great. Got something for you. All right. There you go. There you go. You need one of those. Oh, yeah. There you are. Now I'm feeling really crabby. <laughs> Pardon me. I've, I've got to get a lawyer because there's a clause I have to have checked. <laughs> I've known the folks at Fadley's Seafood for years. 
but they've been serving up fresh crab cakes even longer. Hi, I'm uh, Nancy Fadley Devine. I own Fadley Seafood. It's been uh, in my family now for, well, four generations, and the fifth is coming up, so we've been around a long time. I think people are astonished to see my parents at 84 and 89 still working. You can get another five minutes and do a second batch if you need to with them. People ask her for her autograph, they ask her for a picture, they ask her to hold their babies. You know, it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, here's this company that's been part of Baltimore for over 130 years. Yeah, right. Uh, what, why, what, what is it about your place that has people coming back Right. I think it's that people come in here and go right away. There's a warmth. Uh -huh. There, it's like walking to somebody's home. That's they're they're happy to have you. Uh -huh. You know, come and you feel. Oh my gosh, I feel at home. And I get people. We were here 20 years. It's exactly the same. In fact, Fadley still stands in its original location, founded here by John W. Fadley Sr. in 1886 started off as a seafood stall, but over the generations grew into a Baltimore tradition, led by Bill and Nancy Devine, along with their daughter. Damie Hahn, and I am the fourth generation of Fadley's, so I do everything. <laughs> Give them a little bit of a smorgasbord of everything. Going over here to fillet a fish, over here to shuck an oyster, over there to steam a crab, back here to fry, up here to make a crab cake, back down on the phone running in the shipping department. A tray like that is about, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bushels of crabs in order to get that tray. That's a lot of picking. And I don't think people realize how much work goes into getting an all jumbo lump. Growing up, did you, did you think you were gonna end up here? You were gonna be doing this? No, <laughs> no, but it was hard to get away from and I couldn't see it going away. I couldn't see, see it ending with my parents. So the pandemic hit. Yes. You really had to step up. My father called me and I said, Dad, you guys cannot come in here. You know, the, we, we don't know anything about this, this virus and, and the effects, especially on the elderly. And I know you want to be here, but you can't. And he said, Damien, do whatever you do, whatever you can to make payroll. It just makes me cry when I think about it. Um, he said, just make sure that we don't have to lay anybody off. I don't want to lay anybody off. I don't want anybody to lose their job. And we did it. And I saw it back when I came here in the 90s, and I still see it today. This truly is a family. Oh, it is a family. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because I often tell people, mom and dad don't treat the employees any differently than they treat me. And that's the God's honest good, truth. Which could be a good or a bad. <laughs> that's the God's honest truth. And that's why you end up having so many multi-generation families staying here. That's right. Fadley's isn't just a family-owned business. It's run by family as well. Multiple generations of employees, father and daughter, father and son, mom and daughter, all building a home here. I've been here since a junior in high school, so I've been doing the thing for a while. I'm going to say it's been around 30 three, 34 years. And I started at the end of 79, uh, a week before my son was born. I started at 14 years old, and I'll be 42 years old in December. It's always a challenge working with family. <laughs> a lot of personalities, but you love each other and it always works, you know, it always works well. It's, what's really, really bad is when your kids are grandmothers. Mom, we were in the middle of an interview. <laughs> oh, you just broke in. <laughs> you have to start over? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you were saying about the challenges of working with family? <laughs> it's just a few of them, you know? Just a few. While the family spirit makes customers feel at home, it's Fadley's crab cakes that keep them coming back. What kind of oil do you cook your crab cakes in? Thank you. So excited to have this. And I watch people for the first time put it in their mouth and they go, oh my God. <laughs> and, I go, and they're standing at a table in a market. Yeah. They're not sitting down to a white tablecloth and having somebody serve it on a silver platter. It's on a paper plate, but it's it belongs on a silver platter. 
Nancy created her recipe in 1987, saying she's never changed it. So besides yourself, how many other people know the Fadley's crab cake recipe? Sleep with her, she won't tell me. <laughs> he doesn't even know how to make a cup of coffee. <laughs> Why would I tell him? <laughs> so some people use breadcrumbs, you use it's crushed broken up salty. Saltines. Broken salty, yes. And not, not fine because no. you have to use more. Now, so. And then this is the magic sauce. Is this the secret sauce? Yes. So it's just enough to mix the ingredients it's together, right. nothing more. That's right. And the Mine big is. ball of crab right there. That's it. Boom. This. Oh boy. Oh. It was just like I remember eating it 26 years ago. You know what? I'm told that all the time when people come in here. The best part about this is you haven't changed a thing. Now, this is a legacy. Well, we know how the crabs end up, but how do they get them? Let's go find out. Coming up, the generations of black watermen who've made a living pulling in Maryland's most famous catch. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Our week-long journey across America, from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. It's your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Chesapeake Bay men and women who work these waters are probably just as famous as the legendary catch that they pull out. And in fact, it's backbreaking work that is passed on from generation to generation, including blackjacks. Those were the black watermen who worked these waters all the way back into the 1800s and are a vital part of this community. The Chesapeake Bay is home to a vast variety of seafood, but none as valuable or as well known as the blue crab. The catch here makes up over a third of the nation's supply, and on average, more than 50 million pounds of blue crabs are harvested from the bay. I'm Captain Tyrone Meredith, charter boat captain, owner and operator of the Island Queen 2. Captain Meredith knows these waters well. He grew up on them. I'm the fourth generation uh, waterman and my grand, great grandfather, he worked on the water, my grandfather and my father. We've been here ever since the 1860s, making a living working on the Chesapeake Bay. This has been the way of life for generations of watermen here in Kent Narrows, a town just 50 miles south of Baltimore. 
for hundreds of years. They've caught, processed, and sold blue crabs to markets up and down the eastern shore. By the mid to late 1800s, Kent Narrows had also become one of many unlikely havens on the bay for free and enslaved African Americans. There was more black uh, watermen anywhere on the whole East Coast, probably in the United States. Those watermen, also known as blackjacks, forged their path to liberation on the water. Their expertise essential to the booming seafood industry. So much so, the government granted some black watermen seamen's protection certificates, providing sailors with American citizenship and a path to economic freedom. Hey, Lewis, I'm coming up on you now. Okay, I got you. Yeah. How they biting today? This morning it did pretty good. Well, being out here is your own boss. You do what you want to do and let nobody tell you, go get me this or go get me that. 75-year-old Lewis Carter still finds that same sense of freedom on the water today. He's also one of the last generations of black watermen alive. Every morning before the sun rises, he sets out to catch crabs in the bay. I started in 1961, now bay 15, and I've been at it ever since. Right now, uh, I'm going down the line, and I, when I get to the other end, I'll throw it off. Crabs will come up on that bait. The pressure from the water pushes them back in this dipper. Okay, these are the big, large males. You put them in one basket. That's a female with red claws. Put them in one basket. He's one of the last Mohegans left. Not too many people that still work, make a living from the water. Most of them moved away, got all the jobs, and it's changing because it's harder to make a living from the bay. Crabbing season runs from spring into late fall, but changes in climate, cost, and labor have made each successive year more challenging. As younger generations take up new trades, there are less people working the waters and ultimately fewer black watermen. Back when I started, it was a plenty of black water, but they died out and the younger ones never taken their place. It, in, a, in one way, it makes me feel bad, you know, and I don't think it would be no chance no more black water. I really do believe that. Captain Meredith estimates there are fewer than a dozen black watermen on the bay. Like many of his peers, he's had to turn to other work. Back when I was crabbing teenager, I caught high as 50 bushel a day. Right now, crab is catching two or three bushel a day. Now I started running charters, fishing charters, because crabbing started declining and, and the fishing was more lucrative money-wise. And educational. His charters are an opportunity to keep stories of the blackjacks alive for generations ahead. Although tradition on these waters is changing, one thing remains the same. Nothing tastes like the Chesapeake Bay Maryland crab. It's got that certain taste to them. And, and it's the only place like that in the world is the Chesapeake Bay Blue Crab. Next, an up-and-coming Baltimore chef inspired by his family's love of cooking. People really don't know what's going to happen. Nearly a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There is some late breaking news. Four hours into the Iowa caucuses. By the way, I'm All right, it just did week-long journey across America from Washington, D.C., a side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. This is your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> Was talking smack part of this? We began our Cross America journey tonight. St. Louis, Austin, here in Nashville, from Washington, D.C., the side of our nation's capital, you rarely see. This is your last movie. <laughs> 
<laughs> was talking smack part of this? What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Back in Baltimore, a new generation is putting a spin on the crab cake. I'm Alex Perez. I'm the owner of Poppy Cuisine. I'm an artist at heart, so uh, cooking, um, the arts of culinary, you know, that's something that I'm very passionate about. Not necessarily having a recipe to go off of and just getting in the kitchen, freestyling and coming up with a masterpiece. It's that freestyling approach that brings people through these doors, clamoring for a taste. Jumbo, crab, crab is king in Baltimore, so um, you're going to see crab cakes, uh, crab cake fries, crab cake egg rolls. Everyone's been going crazy over it as well. This is the ball. So I just come back for that and I enjoy it every time I come here. We actually live in D.C., so we rode all the way up here an hour just to come here. Right now I'm drizzling our warhead and our aioli sauces on it. I have a family from the Dominican Republic. I'm Afro-Latino. I'm black on my mother's side. And pretty much I'm just always had a love for food and uh, cooking food, eating food. So learning how to cook from my, my dad. So my dad taught me how to cook at the age of 10. I grew up, you know, watched my grandmother cook a, a lot as well. So I started pretty much combining the uh, foods that I learned to cook from my grandmother with the foods I learned how to cook from my father. And that's kind of like how the uh, whole poppy cuisine, you know, was, was born it's in her kitchen, essentially. That was eight years ago. While working a full-time job, Alex began building a new business on the side, catering food out of his grandma's kitchen. In February 2020, he was finally able to open a restaurant. Then the pandemic hit. Of course, you know, a month later, we get the news that we have to shut down and only do takeout. So that just opened up the, uh, the, the floodgates, essentially. And you have people standing in line hundreds of people <laughs> on the block and in, in that mass, you know, cars double parked up and down the streets. And it was, it was just may, it was mayhem. During a global crisis, the city Alex was born and raised in rallied around him. Now, Poppy Cuisine is packed with locals and tourists alike. But the chef stays true to his roots, running it with close family and friends. My little sister, Natasha. Hi. <laughs> How's it going? Natasha. My big bro, Alex. I can employ family members, friends, and so forth, you know, that are people who I grew up with, people that I'm close to, and it's very rewarding, you know? Coming up, I'm going to grab my apron and join Alex and Grandma Gloria for a lesson in cooking crap. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? The Today Show's newest fan. Little Al Roker.
We've got a Congress that doesn't seem very functional. What's this election year going to look like? Are we getting ahead of the science? Are we behind the science? How much did this booster confusion set us back? Can the January 6th committee come up with anything that would change Republican minds? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. We begin our Cross America journey tonight. St. Louis, Austin. Here in Nashville. From Washington, D.C. The side of our nation's capital. You rarely see. This is your last movie. <laughs> <laughs> was talking smack part of this. What are you doing for teachers who feel that they're being stretched too thin? Did you understand how prevalent hunger was in your own community? I wanted to meet Alex and his grandma Gloria, the inspiration behind his cooking. So I dropped by their kitchen to say hello. Well, I know I picked up from my grandmother, my mother-in-law, and um, just put my own spin on certain dishes. I didn't follow it to the, the recipe to the letter. So you're able to add a little bit. Yeah, but he's always asked me uh, when I fix the dish, well, what did you put in this? How did you do, how did you do this? And I would tell him, I said, you don't have to follow to the letter, you know, put your own spin. And Alex has done just that, turning the classic crab cake into an egg roll. Genius! The ingredients, simple. A pound of jumbo lump crab, panko breadcrumbs, aged cheddar cheese, egg roll wrappers, and a couple of sauces and microgreens to top it off. There's the star of the show, the crab meat. Put on an apron, I've got rubber gloves on. All right. Patient's ready. So how do we get started, Alex? Yeah, so first what you want to do is say we have some uh, Maryland jumbo lump crab here. Uh -huh. So for the most part, I shouldn't have much shells in, but mm -hmm. uh, typically uh, I like to sift through it. Just gotta see if there's any shells, and if so, you can put the shells right back in this oh. uh, container. There you go. So Gloria, did you know you were ra helping raise a, a culinary genius? <laughs> well, no, but I know he liked to eat. <laughs> <laughs> This sauce particular is our, our crab sauce mix. Okay. So we're gonna drizzle a little bit at a time. Cause I don't wanna put too much, right. just enough to uh, bind. You got enough for Al? Yep, I think I'll have enough. Oh, she's, she's stay <laughs> by me, I like this. I like this lady. This is why I'm so particular uh, about, you know, when I'm doing things in the kitchen. Uh huh. Start actually rolling these things up. Yes. Why? Why? Why do you think this this recipe is, is so popular at the restaurant? The most popular. Um, well, I think uh, because it, it pretty much gives you the ability to uh, take a a bar more favorite and you know make it handheld and on on the go. Uh -huh. You know, it's throwing your hand. Kind of street food. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's one of the, the biggest reasons it's it's very popular. Other than the taste as well. Right, well, exactly. You know. <laughs> yeah, because that's You can take taste. it with you, but if it doesn't right, taste good, right, exactly. you know, come back for it. Yeah, so what we're going to um, do is uh, we're going to take like a, a pinch of uh, crab. It's around like a, a quarter cup or so. Mm -hmm. We're going to sit in the middle. Is that too yep. much? Yeah, we're going to take a little bit out, a little pinch out. Actually, we want to put a little bit more in. Yeah. Which is it? <laughs> All right, so that's perfect right there. That's right, perfect, perfect. <laughs> and we're gonna Just literally fold them up envelope style. And what is it about cooking and family that, that, that is so important? Yeah, I think uh, for me, um, you know, living a, a busy life as a business owner and a dad, a husband, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I feel like uh, food is a uh, opportunity for family to come together, you know, talk about things, especially if you haven't seen each other in a long time. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a way for us to connect, so. Yeah, yeah. Lawrence, is, it, is it true you've never done this before? No, I haven't. It's true. Oh. Could have fooled me that you never did this before. Look at that. <laughs> Bam! Done! Faster than I did. Wow! <laughs> Wow, that natural grandma thing. Love it. So now we're gonna get get the deep fryer up here and fry these bad boys up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Woo! You had to describe the heart of your cuisine. What is it, and and how does Baltimore uh, kind of part of that? Pretty much my my story, and I think that connects very well to our Baltimore. You know because. You know, I, I grew up here, you know, all my life, and 
I think everything that um, I faced during the time that you know, I started this company up until now. I've been transparent about that, and it resonated very well with the uh, the, uh, the people in Baltimore, and they, they watched my journey through the years. And I feel like that's that's really the, the heart of what mm -hmm. I do. Make sure and to crisp around the edges and then things like that. So that's why I keep turning them, you know, so it doesn't uh -huh. fry on one particular side too much. And just want to even fry. Mm. Nice and golden. So you want to cut these diagonally. So. Yeah. so I'm going to drizzle. This is our aioli sauce, house made, and this is our warhead sauce right here. <laughs> so the sauce is kind of sweet, has a tangy bite to it. Oh, kind of like Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's right. Well, I guess there's only thing, one thing left to do. Yeah, and that's Try the piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cake egg roll. Yeah. Here we go. Wow. Chef Al, you have done Baltimore proud. Thank you. <laughs> Our time here in Baltimore is coming to an end. We tried the traditional crab cake, tasted a modern spin with crab cake egg rolls, and even went straight to the source on the Chesapeake Bay. At the center of it all, one thing still ringing true. Food tastes better when you eat it with family. Good morning, breaking news, turbulence. The new 5G cell service rolls out overnight and forces some flights to cancel already, even after that last minute deal between the airlines and the cell carriers to delay launch near some airports. No, I understand why this Cell phone companies be upset they spent billions of dollars, but you know what? That's not my problem. This morning, an inside look at the safety concerns, the blame game, and the impact on passengers. Hitting reset, President Biden holding a rare news conference today to mark one year in office, facing serious questions about his agenda and influence in Washington, the administration's response to the pandemic, rising inflation, and escalating tensions on the world stage. A live report from the White House straight ahead. Arctic blast, another round of frigid temperatures across much of the country, spreading from the Rockies all the way to New England, as parts of the South brace for more snow and ice. Al's got your full forecast. Grief and anger in Los Angeles, a suspect identified overnight in the stunning murder of a grad student, her heartbroken father speaking out. It's just not right. You have to put a stop to this. And in New York, an emotional vigil for a woman pushed to her death in front of a subway train. Just ahead, the urgent calls for action to deal with increasing crime rates and homelessness in major cities from coast to coast. All that plus legend lost fashion icon Andre Leon Talley, Vogue's first African-American creative director, has died. This morning, the tributes pouring in as we look back at his groundbreaking life and legacy. And back on track. The beloved Jamaican bobsled team qualifies for its first Winter Olympics in 24 years. And join us for an exclusive interview as the world gets set for the long-awaited return of cool runnings today, Wednesday, January 19th, 2022. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Cuffey, live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. It is Wednesday morning. It is so nice to be here. Can is I just it say you? it again? It yes, is you're so here. nice good. to be here. So Finally, glad. testing negative and oh, feeling good. And I've it's just nice to be with everybody. Yeah, we've been waiting patiently for you. So happy you're right back where you belong. Well, we've got a lot to get yeah. to this morning, too, including President Biden's news conference later today. It marks his first year in office, and it comes with him facing several major challenges here and abroad. Yeah, that includes the Ukraine, where more than 100,000 Russian troops are positioned along the border this morning amid concerns an attack 
is all but imminent. That was the word from the White House yesterday. And here at home, there are new measures in the battle against the coronavirus. The White House has launched a new website to provide free at-home COVID tests. And hundreds of millions of N95 masks are now available as well. We've got it covered from the White House to Ukraine. But we are going to start with the nation's two largest wireless carriers flipping the on switch for 5G overnight. And that rollout did include a temporary delay for the second time this month with AT&T and Verizon pressing pause at some airports. NBC's Tom Costello is on the story, joins us from Reagan National this morning. Hi, Tom. Morning. Yeah, good morning, Savannah. So as you know, the airline industry and the cell phone industry have been going at each other for months now. The aviation industry concerned that 5G will interfere with critical cockpit technology, could result in thousands of flights canceled. The cell phone industry saying nonsense. This is rolled out safely in other countries. No reason, is re no reason to believe it's a threat here. But at the last hour yesterday, we saw the cell phone companies blink. They are turning off 5G around airports. Fifth generation or 5G cell service is officially here this morning for millions of Americans with AT&T and Verizon launching their ultra high speed networks overnight after reaching a last minute deal with the nation's airline.